Good morning. Good morning. Can I ask everyone to take their seats, please? Always the same, herding cats, always the same. Hardcore group, if ever I saw one. So thanks, everyone. I will start with uh, here's the message you need to put out. Um, there's a car in the car park SP22 URT. If you are the owner, your windows are down and it will rain because it is Scotland. So none of you, fine. But I've done my bit. So if it goes wrong, plausible deniability. So thanks, everyone. Um, this is another kind of part of the journey as we go through the piece for SPSP adult and the collaborative celebrations that have been on. So I'd like to welcome everyone in the room and I'd like to um, welcome everyone who's on the hybrid event. So please be mindful that there are probably just as many people online as there is in the room. So we're keen to be as inclusive as possible. I'm Eddie Doherty. I'm the Executive Nurse Director for NHS Lanarkshire. And I keep getting that one wrong because I sit beside my wife and send, and she says, Maria Doherty, NHS 24. And then I say something completely random because she's put me off. But it is Lanarkshire, I think, that I work in. Housekeeping. Wi-Fi code as on the screen. Now, the clever people in the room have all got yellow lanyards. Feel free to bother them as much as you like. If you've got any problems, just go to the organisers. Fire alarms, there is none planned. Should there be a fire alarm, run for your life. Simple as that. I'll be first out, follow me, those doors and out to the right. I would ask for all of the basic principles of if you have a mobile, keep it on silent, preferably off if possible. We would ask that you contribute as much as possible. I realise we are all email dependent, but if I could ask you not to focus on that during the event. There is recording going on and there is photography. If you do not wish to be photographed, you're going to have to do that and wonder about because it is live. We're using Slido for the event. So the QR codes are on the screen, but actually just as importantly, they're on your desks and your tables, and they're across all of the pillars. So feel free to use them. Um, David Watson is in the, the group. He is our QR national expert. If you've got any problems with QR codes, David Watson on that group. Why are we here? Sometimes it's actually goes without saying why we're here. I've said in a variety of groups, Patient safety people are a family. You, we have worked together for years to make our patients and indeed our staff as safe as possible in truly complex environments. You have all contributed to making NHS Scotland as safe as possible. That work isn't complete. That work will never be complete. So, we are amongst the first generation to push on this, but it is setting the standards and pushing forward across the next series of generations of healthcare. We know things are tight. We know staffing is a challenge. Money is a problem. You're all good at innovation. You're all good at keeping the patient at the heart of everything we do. And for that, that is going to be the biggest winning ticket we have over the next five to 10 years. So as the collaborative comes to an end, what does the next steps look like? What do we do? How do we influence our boards? How do we take the next steps into a challenging future? The innovation, as I said, we have seen from this group and indeed your colleagues has been astonishing over the years. So I challenge this group that you will be the arbiters of a new generation and a new structure for the NHS. And I believe it will be patient-centred, given the work everyone has done. Key point is connecting with colleagues. 
every time I come to do one of these things, I know more and more people in the room. And that's one of the reasons I keep coming back. It's a pleasure and I learn so much every single time we do this. So we'd encourage and support that networking opportunity while you're here. I broke it. Three slides in and I broke it. It's not a good start. Anyone? So it's a fair drawing in then. It's kind of summer, not and it's kind of spring. So the agenda, he said, trying to temporise. Um, I'll just have a seat. I'll put it up. Okay. So that was the chair's welcome you've just had. So um, we'll invite uh, Joe Matthews and Claire Maven up to discuss and celebrate the programme that we have. Then we'll move on to Falls and the Falls Plenary. So we have some very exciting speakers over the course of uh, this morning and this afternoon. And you should have picked your breakout sessions. Please, can you stick to your breakout sessions? The numbers are deliberately balanced. Um, otherwise, we've got the usual chaos of there's 200 people in one room and one in the other. So if we can balance that out, that'll be helpful. Breakout sessions in falls, which is a hybrid session, and the breakout session on the deteriorating patient, which again is hybrid. We're looking for you to get as much information as you can from today to take forward into your own clinical environments. And we've seen some excellent work coming through in all of these strands. To the WebEx audience, welcome. What we would ask is that you pose your questions in the chat box. What we will do is invite questions from the audience here to allow you time to type in, and then we'll come to the WebEx participants. For those asking questions in the room, it is recorded, and the guys on WebEx will not be able to hear you unless you use a mic. So please wait for that mic and introduce yourself. This is a team game. You all know that. So the clinical staff we are reaching out to is everyone. We have key representation from nurses, AHPs and doctors. Clearly nurses are the best. So we'll leave that standing. That's, that's a given. We have QI colleagues and QI experts in the room. And we have students. And it's back to that point of how do we promote this for our next generation? Scottish Government, well, that's the only reason I'm here is to keep in with Scottish Government, see if they'll give us any more money for Lanarkshire. I don't see that happening. We've got the Care Inspectorate and we have international kind of involvement with this. This is a big deal. It's you guys that will make it. So there's an online delegate bag, again, with David's QR codes with all of the speakers' information, storyboards, and everything. And after today, you will be able to access the video links and the presentation. And we are keen that you do use X. I'd love to say Twitter, but I'm sure that's banned now. We can't call it Twitter. You can use X, and here's the hashtag for that. Thank you for your contribution today, and I look forward to the conversations. I'd like to pass to Joe Matthews, the Associate Director of Improvement and Safety, and one of the key individuals who's driven this agenda over the years. And her personal contribution, I think, has been truly significant in how we go about business today in NHS Scotland. So with that, I'll pass to Joe. Good morning, everybody, and I'm delighted to, to be here what promises to be an absolutely fantastic day celebrating the amazing work that you have been delivering um, since September 2021 when this collaborative commenced, but also reflecting back on the incredible work of the Scottish Patient Safety Programme that has been in existence now for some 16 years. So it really is a, a a fantastic achievement that many of you in this room have been on that journey with us um, for a number of years. I particularly chose that picture that you see on the screen here today because I took that in my spare room 
on the day of the, the launch of the, the collaborative back in 2021, because I needed a picture to be on this Teams channel that we were using um, to launch the collaborative. Um, and I thought it was really timely to make sure that we we actually wrap that up and, and reflect back on that day, the excitement of what we were about to do within a time when which it was incredibly challenging. And we were embarking on um, delivering this collaborative for the first time um, at that point virtually. So through a completely different method in which we had been working until that point. So as Eddie says, what did bring us together at that point and what brings us together today is the Scottish Patient Safety Programme. So, as I said, it is a national improvement programme that's been in existence now for some 16 years. It's the longest standing quality improvement programme. And the aims have remained constant throughout of that. And we continually test that to check that that is the case. And consistently we get back, absolutely, this is the focus. This is what brings us all together on a day-to-day -day basis. That aim to improve the safety and reliability of care and reduce harm. And we do that through this programme through three separate elements. The essentials of safe care, which I'll come on to shortly. Each of those individual SPSP programmes that have a specific setting, care setting um, angle and have a, a particular areas of improvement focus within each of them. And you can see here the, the, the depth and breadth that that work reaches. And underpinning all of that, the learning system what you are here today to participate within. Um, and that acts as the accelerant in which we are able to then support the improvement, to be able to sustain that improvement and to spread it um, beyond those teams that are initially starting that work. So at the heart of that is the essentials of safe care. And through this collaborative, it was the first one to actually test how does this actually work when we are addressing improvement priorities? You can see here that each of those four primary drivers that support the delivery of safe care for every person within every setting every time are not things that would be of any surprise to any of you. But it was through the health and care system that brought these together and identified these were the core elements that actually if we do fundamentally address these we can make the improvements in safety that are required and continue to be required in our system on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, you can access this information and all the resources that rest behind this within your virtual delegate bag. And there is a range of tools there, from an interactive driver diagram, from a measurement plan, from a readiness assessment to understand whether or not your team um, is in a place to actually make that change, but also then an assessment to understand where are you on the journey in delivering these essentials of safe care and what are the things that you may need to do to be able to prioritise and focus and then address these also through the improvement work that you're doing. And through the course of today, you're going to hear about how those essentials of safe care have acted as enablers in achieving the fantastic improvements that have happened across two and a half years we've been working. <laughs> so on that day back in September, and I remember it was an absolutely roasting hot day, as my spare room ends up like an oven in the summer, um, we came together to make a commitment to learn to improve the safety and reliability of care and, and reduce that harm. We were standing on the shoulders of many years of SPSP work, but despite those challenging times, we had the pandemic still ongoing. There was a belief and there was a real opportunity that we could make a difference and that we could start that journey and make impacts within acute care. You made that commitment on that day and we have seen through the course of the last two and a half years the impact of that focus and that relentless focus that you have undertaken. And we really wanted to just flag something about that sense of urgency around single topics. So that focus on improvement, that focus on safety and within an acute care setting. And over the course of this collaborative, each of these aspects from Cotter have been absolutely identified through the work that you have been doing. Building and maintaining that coalition and that absolute 
precision on this is what we are going to do. Developing the local and that national strategic vision about how we're actually going to deliver it. Being able to consistently communicate that vision, get that buy-in and that engagement. And at a time when the system was under huge challenge to maintain that has been phenomenal. And as those gains started to build, being able to accelerate that through the learning system work, sharing and spreading the Teams channel in which you have been um, adding all of your resources, posing questions to, to each other and seeking that support and being able to celebrate those wins as you, as you go. And we know that there has been times when we have actually had to step back and say, you are under way, way too much pressure just now. So we made the decision to extend the collaborative and give it another six months because of the pressures. Um, but actually in doing that, what we also heard was, no, we want to keep going and we will continue to work throughout these challenging times in this work. And we're at a stage now where we have to think about, so how do we really truly embed the improvements that have been made? How are we going to sustain and spread them alongside starting to tackle and address some of the new challenges or other challenges which are coming to the fore um, of which this programme may be able to support? How have we done the work through these two years? There has been some significant areas of focus. And we've built on work that um, I would highly recommend that you have a look at through the This Institute. Um, Professor Mary Dixon Woods, who some of you may have heard at some of our um, national learning sessions, who recently published um, some papers around high performing improvement collaboratives. And actually, as we read that paper, we absolutely could acknowledge much of the areas and the key enablers that had been delivered through this um, SPSP collaborative were mirroring what Professor Mary Dixon Wood was calling out as those key factors that we actually needed. That focus on metrics, being able to align the priorities locally and nationally, providing yourselves with the support in terms of actually continuing to continually measure as you make those improvements, um, but also supporting teams to build that capability locally as well. Throughout this whole programme, it has been co-designed. From the six months prior to the programme being launched, the work that was undertaken right across the health, health and care teams to be able to identify what were those priorities, to the consistent then readapting um, re and redesigning the improvement packages to ensure they continually reflected what your context was. The use of that learning system to be able to share the information that we were we were learning through your the the national picture, but also at that local level in those teams, and adapting that support to each of the individual boards' needs. And each of you have had a range of different areas of support that you have required, and the team have listened to that and have adapted and have learned on themselves and how they are going to do it. I think the visible leadership is a twofold. This has absolutely been about the support within the boards to see this as a priority, to absolutely put the resource behind it and the commitment and support the development of the culture in which we're enabled to continue to do this work. When it very easily could have been, that's not the priority, you need to do something else. So that continued commitment around SPSP is absolutely visible. But at that national level as well, from our colleagues in Scottish Government who continue to support consistently this programme of work, to the teams um, right across SPSP who are learning together, particularly around the essentials of safe care, about how we embed this into um, the collaboratives through each of the individual programmes and ensuring that we keep the, the safety profile as high as possible. And it wouldn't be SPSP without that systematic application of the quality improvement methods. We continue to adapt and use a range of them, but at the heart of that is um, the model for improvement. And we recognise that over the last certainly um, <clears throat> two to three years through that pandemic period, the use of those skills, the ability to use those skills um, has been um, reduced and in many cases lost. So we've had to ensure that through the collaborative, 
but we've started to build them back up again. Um, and we continue to work with our colleagues in NES as well, and you're delighted to have colleagues here today that will be supporting some of those QI skills development. And that is something that we are absolutely committed to. So I'm delighted now to hand over to Claire Maven, who has been instrumental in this collaborative over the last two and a half years. And you're going to hear about how these enablers have now achieved the impacts that we are seeing today. So over to Claire. Morning, everybody. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to see so many people in the room and welcome to our online audience as well. Uh, I don't need to tell people in this room what we've been focusing on. Hopefully you are uh, living and uh, breathing this every single day. But as you know, Joe's described back in September 2000, um, what were we doing, 21? Um, and before that, when we were doing the co-design of this programme, we, we heard from you all that it was really important that we focused on a couple of things, a couple of things that meant the most to you, that you felt that we could apply the method to and we could really make a difference. And for them, we came down to these two topics, that being the deteriorating patient and looking at that, improving recognition and response to uh, patients that are deteriorating with our measure of cardiac arrest reduction and reducing falls and falls with harm. So what impact have you made in the room? So we have the data and we love our data, you know, it's at the heart of SPSB, but I think it's fair to say what we've heard from you all through the narrative reports, through visiting you in the sites, is just that shifting of the culture. And particularly, we've heard it around falls. And many years ago, we measured and we were quite focused on that risk assessment for falls. And this was the be all and end all. If you didn't have a risk assessment, Jackie's staring at me, the false coordinator here, so I better watch what I'm saying. But if you didn't have your risk assessment, and we know that's important, then you know that was the be all and end all. Now we know it's much more than that. It's much more than that. It's about the enablement of people. It's about getting people moving. It's about activity. And that's borne its fruit. So we're now in a position where the rate of falls in Scotland for teams taking part in this collaborative is 9% less than when we started the collaborative. And I couldn't have dreamed that we'd have got to this place because it's been the most challenging of times, but yet we have, and we've got there because of the work of the teams and the boards. We have many storyboards around the room today and there will be in the breakout rooms as well. So if you want to know how do people and teams do this, have a look at the storyboards and, and you'll see. Now, we knew that cardiac arrest and the deteriorating patient work was a bit tricky. And we knew that because of the people who were involved in this right at the beginning were right in the thick of the COVID pandemic when we launched it. So I think it's fair to say for the deteriorating patient work, it is a bit later in coming on stream than the falls work. But the teams have really been focusing on getting the data right. How do we know how many of our patients are having cardiac arrests within acute hospitals? So looking at their data sets and getting that right so they can understand their system. And from that, they've moved on to mapping their response to what happens when patients deteriorate. You'll hear some more about this work in the breakout. And again, uh, take some time to have a look at the board's storyboards. So as part of our narrative template, which the teams kindly fill in um, when they submit the data, we, we've added some questions as we've gone along because we want to understand what has made the difference. You know, why has this collaborative been a success? How have we reduced falls by 9% during a, such a hard time? And what you've told, I've picked out a couple of things today, but what you've told us is the things that have made the difference. So the readiness for change, taking that time to understand your system, to support your teams before you just dive in and get going. So we've heard quite a lot of that from teams. But today is a really good example, just providing that opportunities to network across Scotland, to hear about that evidence-based practice, the change ideas, things that have worked, things that have not worked so well. I do want to take a minute to thank you, and sometimes thank you seem corny, but in this case, it definitely is not. So I remember Joe saying to me, you need to design a collaborative, and I know we're in lockdown, and I know it's a pandemic, but you need to do it because the boards are telling us they need more, and we need to do it. And I'm like, I, I can't do this. How are we going to do this? This is ridiculous. People are not going to come. 
And actually, when we held those initial expert reference groups, everybody came. We, we, we couldn't believe it. But I think it was the time people needed something else. And, and we did it and we co-designed it. So for everybody in the room today online who were part of those expert reference groups, the biggest thank you, because this would not have been possible. Of course, to the teams for welcoming us when we come out to the sites to hear about the work, for diligently submitting your data and your narrative reports, absolutely. And you'll be aware that we've take, undertaken some work with people with lived experience, and Megan has done a, a large amount of this work, particularly around sepsis, and again, this work is now informed by people who have lived experience and we were much richer for that. I want a special uh, shout out to the data analysts and the board. Um, they see my name flashing up and they're like, oh no, it's Claire Megan, oh no, but it would not be possible without them. But I've got a really special thank you today for someone. So this person, you, you may have met him, he's in the background, but actually he is a source of wisdom. He is a source of questioning. And when he speaks to us, we, we take a wee minute and we think, yeah, you're right. So I would really like to welcome David Dunkley up to get a wee gift from us. David is our public partner. He has worked at his for eight years. He's going to kill me. I can see him in the back of the room there. <laughs> but uh, I'm so thankful for you, David. So if you could please come up and just get a wee gift from us. Oh, <laughs> so much better than David. <laughs> yeah. so well, you're very welcome. <laughs> no, very deserved. Okay, so we know there's always more to be done. And this afternoon, we're delighted that our colleagues from May as well, it's actually this morning, some breakout sessions around uh, spreading and scaling up this work. But we're going to listen to the boards over the next couple of months. We're going to be coming and having conversations with you. We're going to try and understand what support you need at a national level to scale and spread up some of this work. We said right at the beginning, if you remember, this was never going to be linear. And our colleagues from NES absolutely knew this when they designed it with this nice wavy line. And we've heard from teams, depending on where they are, what kind of clinical area it is, that actually we're back and forth a little bit with some of the work. But we're really, really keen to sustain the gains that we've had here. And over the next few months, we'll work out with boards what supports needed around that. Oh. My God, it just wasn't me. Yeah, it wasn't you. It did something stranger. So hopefully you've all downloaded Slido this morning. If you've not, um, I think there will be a link to it in the chat box online. There's certainly a QR code on your table. And we want to understand in one word, Slido doesn't do well with sentences, um, what you describe your improvement journey in one word. Give you another few seconds to put the words in. Okay. So challenging. So that's not surprising, is it? We know it's been challenging, um, rewarding, motivational, a wee bit frustrating at time, but collaborative. Thanks to those who put that in. So what's happening next? So um, whilst this is our last learning session of the current collaborative, it's not surprise you that the work goes on. So we've got a wee bit of wrap up of this collaborative to do. We've got another data submission in May because we've got a bit of lag in the data. We've got another couple of networks for our deteriorating patient and our falls networks to do. And of course, there's all of the work that we carry out within his, we are committed to do a thorough evaluation of this work. So over the next few months, that's what the team will be working on. So we'll deliver the collaborative to its end. We'll evaluate the collaborative 
And then we'll design the next thing because it's, it never stops, does it? So we will be in touch to look at what that is with you all. Uh, so watch this space. So what will the evaluation look like? So it's about looking at the data. It's about analysing the data. But we're also going to do a social network analysis, and I'll touch on that in a minute. We're also going to do an economic analysis, particularly around the falls work. We'll draft the final report and then sort of, I'm going to say late summer, we'll um, uh, publish the evaluation. So the importance of the social network analysis is Eddie touched on the fact that it's becoming more and more challenging. There are limited resources, but we know the power of getting together. We know the power of speaking to people, establishing these networks. And when we've asked what's made the difference, this comes through very strongly. So the team are really, really, really want to find out what the power is of networking. And I think that's important to you and your teams and your boards, but it's also important to us as a national team. So in your delegate bag today, you'll find a QR code to this. It'll take you only a maximum of 20 minutes. And we're really trying to map out what the power of networking has been in the collaborative. We'll be able to feed back a map of your teams within your own boards, but we'll also be able to look at it as a national level. So I would really encourage you to do this because we know that as part of the learning system, networking is super important. So it's in the delegate bag today. So another question here. So we're going to write this evaluation. We hope that people will go, oh, that's great. We'll learn a lot from it. But what would you be most interested to learn from the evaluation when we publish it? So a slide again. So you see it presents a bit differently because we've got multiple words. When you just put one word, it flashes up big. I have to put my glasses on now. Okay, so the next steps, the impact of the expert reference groups, the impact of the collaborative and culture and leadership, and just touched on that with the essentials work, the benefits, further work, how we can spread it. And we're going to take all of these um, inputs that you've put into the Slido so that when we write the evaluation, we are cognizant of them and we try and address as many of them as we possibly can. Great. So while you're doing that, um, we were hoping to have Ms. Jenny Minto, uh, one of the ministers along today to speak to us. Jenny, unfortunately, can't be with us today because she's on Scottish Government business, but she was absolutely determined to record a video to support the work and um, the impact of the work that you're going to hear about today. So I'm going to play a video from Ms. Minto. <laughs> Good morning. First of all, congratulations on coming together, whether virtually or in the room, to celebrate the SPSP Acute Adult Collaborative. I wish I could be there with you today, and I apologise that I can't be, but I was keen to provide a message to you all. Secondly, I would like to thank Healthcare Improvement Scotland, not only for their dedication to the Scottish Patient Safety Programme, but also today especially, for all their hard work in organising this celebration event. I do not underestimate the amount of work that goes into gathering people together, both virtually and in the room, and I know you will be as grateful as I am that this has been done. It is wonderful that so many people from across the health and social care sector are gathered not only to celebrate the success of the Acute Adult Collaborative, but also to share the learning in the delivery of safe care and to become even better at doing so. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of you attending for the work that you have done and continue to do to make health and care in Scotland safer. Colleagues, we don't often get the chance in our day-to-day -day work to pause and reflect. Today, therefore, is a little bit special. 
As you will all know better than anyone, the delivery of safe care for everyone all the time needs to be a focus in every part of our system, in every corner of Scotland. The ongoing success of the Scottish Patient Safety Programme, and in particular, the fantastic successes achieved by the Acute Adult Collaborative, is testament to your hard work and the work of colleagues across the country to improve care for some of those people who are most at risk. Never has that been more important or apparent than now. You and the committed professionals you work with every day have kept a focus on safe care during some of the most difficult times of our lives. You have made a life-saving difference. In my role as Minister for Public Health and Women's Health, I recognise the paramount importance of safe care. When people need access to any part of the health and care system in Scotland, they must have confidence that they will receive treatment that is effective, person-centred and safe. The Scottish, Sa Scottish Patient Safety Programme has been vital to achieving this ever since it first started. When it launched in 2008, this was the first programme of its kind anywhere in the world. Think about that for a second. The first of its kind anywhere. You and your colleagues and the dedicated professionals from years gone by on whose shoulders you stand have been groundbreakers. Over the years, the Scottish Patient Safety Programme has delivered a range of improvements across the system. In other words, you have delivered improvements. When I think what improvement means to patients and their loved ones, it is harm prevented and lives saved. By the hard work and dedication of you and your colleagues, so on their behalf, I thank you. The Scottish Patient Safety Programme continues to be vital, probably more now than it ever has been before. Your focus on patient safety has been crucial over the last few years in providing the environment and the conditions that enabled NHS Scotland to be flexible and adapt quickly to the greatest challenge our healthcare system ever faced. And it's that flexibility and need to adapt that brings us to where we are today. I remember my husband was in the QEUH um, between one of the lockdowns and I felt so comfortable going in and visiting him because I knew of all the safety that was set up round about my ability to visit him and the way that he was being looked after in the hospital. So personally, I thank you for that too. The focus on patient safety has never stopped, but now as we continue on from what has been an intense couple of years, we face a host of different challenges. Your continued support and effort on patient safety is essential. The Acute Adult Collaborative was launched in September 2021 with a focus on falls and the response to deteriorating patients. During that period, and it's worth noting that these years have been some of the most challenging our health service has experienced. 14 NHS boards participated. Data has been submitted covering around 90% of the population. This alone shows your continued commitment to not only improving care, but also supporting each other through sharing learning so that the potential for harm may be reduced across the whole of Scotland. The data shows eight hospitals with a sustained reduction in falls by at least 9%. It shows that five boards are reporting at least 12% uh, least reduction in their overall, overall rate of falls. To put that in context, these reductions have contributed to an ongoing current improvement in the national falls rate, eight consecutive months below the national median. Given the pressures that the system has been under, this is a very significant achievement. Moving on from falls to cardiac arrest rates, the focus of this work was improving the early recognition and timely intervention for deteriorating patients. All of the boards are taking part and work has focused initially on supporting them to establish reliable data collection. This is a hugely important first step to help each board 
understand the current state of their system and to begin improvement work. Notably, that data is already indicating that three hospitals are showing sustained improvement in this rate, and others are reporting an increase in data reliability and understanding of the escalation processes. This is another great step in improving care for those who are most at risk. So, we're all here today to celebrate your successes. You have been an integral part of this fantastic work. We are here to recognise your achievements as a collaborative, working hard at both a local and a national level. As the collaborative comes to an end, it is important that we celebrate what has been achieved and know there is still more to do to continue to improve safety. The future of the Scottish Patient Safety Programme is incredibly exciting. No doubt it will be the subject of many valuable and interesting conversations throughout today's event. I know you will be keen to get on with the day's agenda, so please allow me to say one last thing. I am incredibly sorry not to be able to join you in person today, but I continue to be encouraged and excited about what the future of safe care in Scotland holds. As you celebrate and start to consider what's next, know that you are all working together to deliver safe care for everyone, all of the time. Thank you. Thanks for Miss Minto to take for taking the time out to recording that. Uh, and I'm just going to leave with a big thank you from myself and my team to all of the teams that have been part of the collaborative and a personal thanks to my own team who've worked relentlessly to get where we are today. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and back to the day. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Um, I think a really good overview of where we are and where we've been and some really inspiring words about where we can go next. And on that, can I introduce Dr Lara Mitchell, who's a national clinical lead for frailty in the acute settings and is a nationally respected author and an expert in the subject of falls and frailty. So with that, I'll pass over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. It's lovely to be here and welcome to all of those online. Um, before we look into the data in a bit more depth, I just wanted to set the scene. So let's look at what's going on out there. This was a study, Age UK. They asked 17,000 older people in September 2023. They asked them a whole bunch of questions and I've just got the key ones that pertain to falls. So what people were asked is, what was going on in the previous 12 months? So a third of people said their health was worse. A third said they couldn't walk as far. A quarter were rarely leaving their home and 60% were not confident it would improve. So from this population that were asked these questions, we're seeing they're more housebound, they're more deconditioned. Let's move on and have a look at falls in the community. So this is data from public health. And what we're looking at is an admission rate to ED per thousand population. So while it's not significant, this is the, the top line is the over 85s. And you can see increasing falls in that group. So this is in June 2019. And you can see here, there is a trend that that is increasing in March 2023. So an increasing rate of falls presenting to EAD in that 80, 80, 85 plus. The yellow line is 75 to 84. The green line is 65 plus. As you can see, that falls rate has remained the same. It's certainly not decreased. So that's going on in the UK. Let's look a bit further afield. This is data uh, paper published um, from the USA. They were looking at injurious falls, so falls that resulted in death in 65 plus. And they're looking back, so this is a rate again, but 100,000 population. Um, so in 1998, you can see the blue line is men, the yellow line is women, and there is a clear increase going up to 2023. So here we've got 
people saying they're more conditioned. We've got increasing falls over 85 attending ED and injurious falls resulting in death, which I think setting the context is so important when we look at what the data is showing within hospital falls. So just let's look at this. This is the national picture across Scotland. It's incredible. So data was stabilized in 2021. Um, and what we've seen over time is a kind of a bit of an ironing out of that seasonal variation in winter. And then, as we've heard, a 9% reduction below the median line. This winter, we had a little bump, but not as accentuated as previously. So, given what I've said before, I just feel this is even more incredible and down to, to all your hard work. So, I'd like to just take one minute to just have a round of applause for you all and celebrate this data. However, great accomplishment shouldn't be the end of the road and just the starting point for the next leap forward. And that's going to be some of our conversation for today. So let's look at this board level reduction. So as we've heard, um, five boards have shown um, reduction in falls, and this covers more than 50% of the Scottish population. Four boards have shown a reduction in falls and harm. I want to emphasize that all boards have been working tirelessly, have made improvements, has taken great strides in all their programs of work. And this needs to be celebrated. And, and there's been signals going on elsewhere. And, and I've got no doubt that this improving patient care and the data will follow suit. So this is just two examples. We've got Ayrshire and Aaron showing a decrease of 30%, 13%. And we've got NHS Lanarkshire showing a decrease from the baseline of 11%. So the boards that showed reduction had a variation between 13 to 21%. Now, let's look at what the factors of success are. What's enabled these changes? These, these themes were gathered from narrative feedback, from calls to your boards. And it will be no surprise that to all boards, creating conditions and understanding systems was key to know what was going on, to know what changes could be made. Um, and that came up time and time again. Um, where were the hotspots? Multidisciplinary working was key across the piece, listening to each other. Another thing that I want to emphasize is this language matters. So that kind of set the tone right at the start of the collaborative, talking about safer mobility, talking about falls uh, reduction instead of falls prevention. And we changed our driver diagram on the back of that. That integration, integration across health and social care, but integration within teams. Other themes came up strongly was person-centered care, in, including what matters to me. So developing around the patient and that co-design piece with your patients and with your staff. Education, a huge theme along with tailored coaching. And last and definitely not least is the leadership teams. So everyone in this room. So that setting the tone, and that then influencing the culture. We can't do anything without that leadership piece and that culture of how important these are these themes are. So I've just got the sli a slido question for you next. I'm going to give you some options. Do these themes resonate with you? Yes, no, or partly. Okay, good. So the next question I'm going to ask you to think about is what else would you add to that list? Has everybody done voting? Yeah. Okay, so what else, what other themes would you add to that list? So QI, collaborative, collaboration, family involvement, patient safety, quality planning. 
Great. So keep popping them in because we've got some themes. So QI, family stories, collaboration, governance. So family coming up, family and stories coming up as the, as the most common there. So keep keep voting. So we've got those factors and we've got some other factors coming in there, but now I want to just go on to just talk about what's actually been happening on the ground. What have people been delivering? What are the change ideas going on? And I think what we've seen with everybody feeding back is that they've got that macro level, that structure, but the micro changes that are going on underneath feed into that whole level system approach. Um, so what might be right for one ward will be different in another ward. So safer mobility came up in, in all boards and how it's delivered is different. So about three or four or five boards have got active wards. We've got I can, we've got call, don't fall. We've got individualized person centered care. So people incorporating individualized care plans. What matters to me? We've got visual QI boards going on in some of the boards where they're delivering their tailored education and coaching. Full strategy has been prominent across all the boards and, and certainly some of the boards have got a full strategy overarching across health and social care. Now, everybody's different, not, not one thing's right for others, but this is just an example of the plethora of work going on. Co-design staff patient leaflets, um, so educating patients, incorporating the super six exercises. Something that's been shared recently is at our falls network meetings is this management of stress and distress and cohort base, um, delivering that tailored support and celebrating success. Visual communications, another thing that's come up with safety crosses and yellow blankets, and then different ways of, of, of providing your education. So we've gone from tea trolley training up in Orkney down to developing tea trolleys team channels across the system, across the central belt. So a huge amount, I mean, I can't actually go into all the details. I mean, I, on a personal note, have just, it's been incredible, incredible to witness that energy and enthusiasm and innovation that has gone on through that Falls Network. So thank you all for your, 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 your driven and, um, I'll not say dog with a bone, but just that continuing pushing things forward, trying things, tailoring it. So that's just a snapshot of what's been happening in Scotland. I don't have time to do um, a Slido, but I'd just like you to jot down on a post-it note, which are on your tables. What's the one piece of advice you'd like to tell your former self at the beginning of your improvement journey? And we can maybe just pop them on that um, um, board over there on your way out for break. So goals are for people who care about winning once, but systems are for people who care about winning repeatedly. So that's my update on falls. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the next speaker who doesn't need an introduction. Um, in fact, he said to me, and he said this twice, I heard you say this before, I was born young and I'm not dead yet. <laughs> Professor Brian Dolan, OBE, Director of Health Service 360, Honorary President of Agile, first nurse to be President of Agile, and originated two global movements, Last 1,000 Days, NGPJ Paralysis, and written a number of books. Um, thank you for coming up to Scotland. Thank you also for your influence, which started with the first webinar right at the beginning in September 21. That was quite impactful in a lot of our changes. Um, really looking forward to hearing what you've got to say. Thank you. It's such a nice obituary. Thank you for that. We're going to, Helen and I are going to now move a bit of furniture. So she is, I just do want to shout out Helen. Helen's like, um, she's an absolute star, worth her weight in petrol, who's kindly worked behind the scenes to make this all work. If you're coming in online, you're probably thinking, 
I didn't know we'd come and watch the furniture removal program, but here we are. So those who are over that side now, hopefully you can see. I mean, it's brilliant. There's so many people in the room that have actually added iBox to the, to the place that the people are joining in from. So what I'm going to talk about for the next eight or nine hours um, is, is this. So now what? You made it. Now what? And the reason I, I was kind of flippant when I said this, uh, when we had a, one of the team meetings with Myron, Helen and Lara and everyone, about, you know, if you will, if today is the, on one level, the, the, it's not much the beginning of the end, it's the end of the beginning, but how do you make sure that it isn't the beginning of the end for work around falls and deterioration? What I'm going to argue, if you will, is talk about stories as being at the heart of real movement. Um, because in order to have a movement, you need to move people. And the way we move people is through story. And if you will, have a look at this two-minute story. <laughs> So I think with the power of story, with the power of pictures, we can connect in, in a way that really, really strikes, strikes a chord with people. And my father got us to me, used to say, you know, I look in the mirror and I see an old man. I have no idea who he is because in my head I'm still like 16. And everyone else feels like, yeah, lots of nods around the room. It's true though, isn't it? But if we're really, like, really lucky, all of us are old people in training. You know, and, and old people are always about 20 or 30 years older than you are now. You know, because he passed away 20 years ago at the age of 78. And he used to talk about these young people who were 70. And, you know, and, and if you talk to a 90-year-old, they'll talk about these young 80-year-old whippersnappers. And I think it's very much a mindset. But the thing is, we've known about things like deconditioning falls, iterations, for such a long time. And this is a paper that was before the birth of the NHS itself in December 1947 by Dr. Richard Asher, where he talked about the dangers of going to bed, one of the 20 most influential papers of the 20th century in the BMJ. And while he didn't talk about deconditioning, he talked about the alimentary tra uh, tract, he talked about respiratory, he talked about um, skin integrity, he talked about no body system being unaffected by this stuff. None of this stuff that we're doing collectively in terms of falls and deterioration or service improvement generally, none of it's new. The earliest paper I can find goes back to 1899 with Emile Rees in JAMA, where he talked about it means a great deal to be put on their feet in a short time rather than, being, rather than being confined to bed, having their weak backs and general debility increase rather than disappear after the operation which was to cure them. Skip forward to Second World War, where you've got John Powers in Cooperstown in New York talking about rest 
as a, as the abuse of rest as a therapeutic measure in surgery. We've known about this for decades and decades and decades, but sometimes things come to do with the timing. Now, I wouldn't be a proper nurse if I didn't mention Florence Nightingale, because uh, nearly 180 years, or the 1870s, 150 years ago, she was talking about it's now a well-known rule, she wrote to herself, that to keep no patient in hospital a day longer than is absolutely necessary, and even this may be too long, because the patient may have to recover not only from the illness or the injury, but from hospital itself. The reality is, you know, we may be a better question, it is, is the patient safe for admission, may sometimes be a better question than is the patient safe for discharge. And if you ever hear somebody say, I'm not happy for this patient to be discharged, remind them it's not about our happiness. It's about the patients and their families' appetite for risk. Patients and families are taking risks every single day. We work in our various silos, whether it's A&E, assessment units, the wards, wherever it may be, but the patient travels horizontally and they're the only one with a ringside seat to their own safety. And what we're also doing is we are killing patients with kindness. If you watch that video closely, you'll have seen a nurse with compassion and decency and kindness. And what he was doing, he was stopping that woman from taking the drink herself. Because we're trying to be helpful, aren't we? But actually, the worst thing we can sometimes be for patients is helpful. Because as Eddie and I were talking, we take away their agency. They turn from a, a lawyer, a teacher, a cleaner, a, a barrister, and we turn them into patients. And I don't know what it is in the waters around Glasgow, but you know, you're doing extraordinary work. You look at the brilliant work of the great Professor Don Skelton, who's with us, but also Dr. Julia Harvey, Erin Walker doing her, um, uh, active wards. Uh, folk like uh, Dr. Lisa Morton, who's a psychologist around here, who looked at the impact of wearing a gown on people's sense of identity, sense of self, and all of those things. And when we turn people from pa people into patients, we actually give them, we actually accentuate, I think, the risk of them coming to harm and feeling that they can't speak up about their deterioration, speak up about their risks. You see, we often think of falls as a problem of mobility, but actually what it really is is a problem of immobility. And you'll see in this slide, we've been so successful at terrifying our public so much that they're thinking, well, the best thing I can do is not do anything. And do you know what I do? You know, like, I'm, I'm in hospital now, I'm sick. But here is one of a, and I came across this at the weekend, I discovered Eddie does mountain climbing. This. This is the shadow of the second biggest mountain in the world, K2. There is no easy way to climb K2. It's a 45 degree angle pretty much from everyone. Nobody has successfully summited the east face. And there's been about 800 people who've got to the top of the summit. The death rate from those who have summited is 25.6%. One in four people who reach the top of that summit. It's only about 750 feet smaller than, than, um, than Everest itself. But of the 25% or so of people who've died, 90% of them did so on the descent. And it strikes me that's a pretty powerful metaphor for days like today where you're at the summit on one level. So how do you not die, in a manner of speaking? It's a cheerful topic on a, on a Tuesday morning. But that, that is the thing is that, you know, it was fantastic hearing Cotter being um, cited, but Cotter found that 70% of change efforts fail. They fail flat out. 25% succeed, and I'd sit NPJ paralysis in that space. You know, somewhere is very successful, others less so. Only 5% of, of change efforts absolutely succeed and then built in as business as usual turn into this is how, how we do stuff as little as five percent and the biggest determinants of failure are often we under communicate it's all of the reverse things that cotter there was no sense of urgency there's no guiding coalition there's no sense of sponsorship there's no sense of how can we actually just get on and do this not celebrating the wins now, a lot of these things you've been doing since, uh, since September 2021 have been all of the right bits. Now, I think it's in some respects, in partly about taking it back and taking ownership and stop using, looking for permission. 
Um, you know, Eddie Lord's talking about again this is small. We, we covered a lot of ground myself and Eddie and over a cup of coffee. We agreed that black coffee is the is the reflection of our souls going down. But it is also recognizing that you, we need to stop looking for permission and do stuff and ask for permission later. And um I would can I can I, and I'll, I'll talk about him again later, but can I just point you in the direction of Derek Laidler at the back here? Um because he's done some fantastic work, which has led to, forgive me if I've got, I hope I'm getting this right, a 69% reduction in referrals to the orthopods by uh, triaging them through Allied Health. And did Derek look, say, like, I'm gonna put it in a business case, and then I'm gonna ask for permission. No, he gathered 13 months of data by just quietly getting on with it. And what a success that is for patients, because that means that patients don't have to wait as long. And patient time is the most important currency in healthcare because while our time is busy and important, our patient's time is sacred. But it's also about us recognizing that there is no, no risk and there is no safe. What there is is lower risk and safer. But in order to bring people with us, what we need to do is not focus on the what and the how, it's focusing on the why. Because the what, and many of you will be familiar with Simon Sinek's How Leaders Inspire Action, but many will sell a, a product or sell an idea by talking about what it is and how, how important it is, and, and then very rarely talk about why it's important. We all know what Apple does. They don't start with what, they start with why. They talk about, we believe in changing the, challenging the status quo. We believe that you could have a thousand songs in your pocket. How we've got this is we've got these brilliant engineers in Cupertino out of California that with a stroke of fingers, you know, can up and up a world of voice and song and internet. And what's it called? It's called an iPhone. And people will queue at midnight for a phone that could walk in off the street the following week and just buy. It's true, isn't it? Because if people believe you, they will follow you. If they are committed to you, they will follow you. The most powerful seven words of any tweet in the 21st century was from a leader who was told that we will take you out of your country and take you to safety. And on the 22nd of February 2022, Zelensky said, I don't need a ride, I need ammo. And in the process, galvanized the whole nation that if the Russians were there for 100 years, they will never truly take Ukraine. Because it's the why that builds engagement and cooperation. It's always about the why. And when my, my sister, sister-in-law took very gravely ill um, in December 2019, unexpectedly, and any of you who've got clinical backgrounds, whatever you do, no matter where you are, you're the person who's the go-to for everything. It's true, isn't it? Many will know this. You know, you'd be out and your family member goes, can I show you my rash? I say, well, is there any chance we could get off the dance floor before I started doing this? You know? you know, that's just how it is when you work as a clinician and then you've got that background. But for me, like it was navigating the family and using the phrase, because she was in ICU, she's sick enough to die. Because what that does is it doesn't, it doesn't quench hope, but it does bring realism. And I think when we're talking about deterioration, when people ask about severity, it's using that kind of language means that people are aware and that, that we won't give up hope, but we are very, very concerned. Because it's connection always back to purpose and the brilliant Helen Bevan and her team where they looked at what about the shared purpose to end PJ paralysis, end pajama paralysis, our nurses, our patients, our doctors, our leaders, our care assistants, our anger and outrage at older patients are deteriorating when we can do something about it. And our purpose is to make sure that every person in hospital gets mobilized when they are ready, whether it's clinically or personally, and that they, every person gets a choice and a chance for the future they want. It has to be out on their terms. The most untapped resource in healthcare are patients and their families. But always remember this, biggest change is the cultural shifts had to start somewhere. Usually with one person, then another, and then another. And on the 1st of December, 1955, this young uh, seamstress, introvert seamstress called Rosa Parks got on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama. And a couple of stops later, on this dirty, wet evening, 
um, the, the, the bus driver told her to move to the back of the bus. Why James Blake? Because James Blake was a racist racist. And he told her to move to the back of the bus. Why? Because she was black. And on this evening, she said no. And he had her arrested. And where she sat down within hours, hundreds were marching. And anyone thinks, oh, that's America for you. Have you seen the state of the place now? It needs a new name. It's not a United States. Before we get too coy and too clever, the same thing that happened to her was happening in Bristol. Because what, they, what those hundreds of people did is they led to the, uh, the Montgomery bus boycott in the 1950s, which also, by the way, was uh, the same thing that happened in Bristol in the 60s. But when she sat down, hundreds marched, including, including a young Black Baptist minister called Dr. Martin King, who had recently arrived in that county. And when she sat down and hundreds marched, within a few years, on the 28th of August, 1963, hundreds of thousands were marching. And what Dr. King talked about was his dream. He talked about, he dreamt of a time when in, in, from the red hills of Georgia, the sons of slaves and the sons of slave owners would sit around a table of brotherhood. Where in the, in the, in the heat of the, of the oppression that was Mississippi at the time, they would go from a, a, a state of oppression to a state of justice and freedom. He dreamt of a time where his four black daughters could play with four white children. They'd be judged not on the color of their skin, but on the content of their character. Elsewhere, he talked about uh, the arc of history is long but bends towards justice. But I'll tell you what Dr. King did not talk about. He did not turn up like an archetypal, stereotypical manager and say, I have the most amazing project plan. Wait till you see my Gantt charts. I'm now going to read out the 42 page strategy. You'll be riveted. Of course he didn't. He talked about his dream because the way it works, it's hearts and minds in that order for a reason. First we believe, then we can do, but you need both. And we also, we under communicate by a factor of 10. You live it, you think it, and then you go somewhere and you go, you know, the Irish for no is I will, yeah, you know. And questions don't mean, uh, I thought we had till 20 past and we started a bit earlier. Is that okay? Can I go till 20 past? Yes. Is that all right? I mean, I'll have to speak even quicker. You know what Irish people are like. <laughs> See, questions don't mean resistance. Questions may, has any, can I ask, and when you, um, you know, when you communicate, go back, a, go back a step. Do you know the communication thing? How many of you have got children or maybe been one? <laughs> How many of you have asked the question of your child or your sibling or your neighbor or your nephew and niece? Please don't do that again. And they go, okay. Who does ever have that experience? That'll be nobody. Because you have to do it again and again and again. And just because there's questions, it doesn't mean resistance. We underestimate how much fear plays in decision making. Will I get into trouble? What happens to my patients? Will my team get into harm? What about my registration? And we have to address those, even if they're not articulated. And we also have to never underestimate the power of permission giving as well as were, as Eddie and I talked about. Your job really is to be the directors of permission giving. And it takes time because it takes one heart, one mind, one conversation at a time. That's how a change occurs. And if you need three reasons why all this matters, here they are. Patience time is the most important currency. Work done by Clark et al in this parish, 48% of people over the age of 85 will die within one year of a hospital admission. And if you had a thousand days left to live, how many would you choose to spend in hospital? But you know, sometimes we have to share and be really creative with the message and never underestimate how much of an impact you can have at whatever you are. If you're looking to the screen on your top right, you have as uh, Chloe Harris in the blue top, a then brand new graduate physio who said, would it be okay if we turned up in our PJs at work? Because her granddad had been in hospital. It wasn't him to be in his pajamas during the day. So that's what happened. And when she started, first one person, then another, this is in all over the place. If you look at the bottom right, the, second, the fellow second from the right, we finally found Wally after years of looking for him. 
This is from Melbourne, and you can see Raj on the left, and you've got um, the, uh, the chief exec and all of his exec team on the right. The fellow on the left-hand side of you, he's one of the registrars. We got an urgent podiatry appointment. Have you seen his fees? Um, people creating uh, Spotify playlists. I've got to move it, move it. You can't say it in any other way. You've got to move it, move it. Uh, get up, stand up. For the crack, I rewrote the words of uh, Bohemian Rhapsody. You know the way you do. Is this the real life or PJ fantasy? Caught in a pack slide, no escape from reality. Pajamas just killed a man, put some PJs on his bed, made him wear him, now he's dead. And these awesome women, they sang it. The Dolan sisters. That awesome man at the back. Mr. Laidler. I'm in for an op, just a normal guy. I've got no breaks, just a gown to tie. And the nurses shout when I go by. God, I'm being sent to just what I will. And you'll see the, the banner over there. Talk to you, uh, uh, he and I did this together with DC Thompson, the Bruins. Um, we're so proud of what we've we've done, and it's going to be in the Bruins comic or the, in the Bruins uh, annual. By the way, also a shout out to Dawn with the, the later life training uh, snacking uh, movement snacking calendar, which I'd commend to you all. But remember, followers need clarity. They need clarity of purpose is your why, clarity of plan is your how and your what, and clarity of responsibility is your who. These are the elements. When you focus on these bits, it all comes together. But also, I love this Palestinian proverb, you can't fatten a cow by weighing it. And look, for no prizes, 70% of new gym memberships start in January. Why? To lose weight and get fit. So there you are, 1st of January, doing all the weights, doing all the running, 2nd of January, look at that, I've lost 600 grams, my work is done. You see, by, Jan by March, the same number of people are going as going in November, but now all you're doing is paying the gym owner's mortgage. You see, some isn't a number, or soon isn't a time, and improvement is not just about measurement, but how do you know you've made a difference unless you measure it? So I'm far from anti, it's and, and, not either, or. But the other thing is we don't need RCTs, because perfect is the enemy of better. You see, you have to focus on what you can control and explore what is possible. But culture, I don't think it changes that hard, honestly. In my head, it's three things, the three H's. Hearts, connect with stories, because that's the why. The head is the context, the strategy, the brilliant work that HIS does, SPS does, and others do. And then the hands, I believe it, I want it, how can I help you? That's, those are the golden things, and have an answer for people who want to help. You see, culture doesn't change just because we want it to change. Culture changes when behavior and everyday realities change. This is who we are, this is what we do, this is what we believe. But also, hope is the conviction that despair will never have the last word. It's been a hell of, tw of a 2020s, hasn't it? You know, I got stuck in New Zealand for over two years, didn't see a single member of my family. But if I had to be anywhere, at least it was in a place with evidence-based po political decision-making by Cinder Ardern. But this is the decade. It feels like it's been written by Stephen King. It's been directed by Quentin Tarantino, but thank God we've got a great soundtrack from Taylor Swift. I mean, you know, you have to... <laughs> it has that at least. But hopeful thinking is that the future will be better than the past. Hopeful thinking is that I, at least, I can do my bit to make it so. That there are many paths to these goals, and none of them are free of obstacles. But if you focus on anything, it's about, I think, working with your people to help them feel they belong. And people belong when they feel seen and heard, when they feel connected to the purpose, when they feel supported, and also they are proud of what they do, where they work, where they are. You see, I love this definition of dreams. It says we are, as a species, addicted to story. Even when the body goes to sleep, the mind stays up all night telling itself stories. I just love that. You see, this is how we connect. We connect through story. And if you can have stories, the personal stories, and, and you know, the work we did together on the Bruins, it's about the personal stories of working with DC Thompson, of one whose grandmother had, uh, had dementia, why this stuff matters to stop somebody falling and coming to harm, the deterioration that occurred to someone they love. When we connect to those, they become personal to us. But to deconstruct them, we have to also ask, what are the stories I'm normally telling I'm only at? Is that true? Is it helpful? Does it serve? And is it kind? 
So sometimes we have to retell the stories. And the people we talk to more than anybody are ourselves. And I tell you all for free, if you spoke to your friends the way you talk to yourself at times, you wouldn't have any. So talking kindly really makes a difference. And one of the stories we need to tell. And this is a story I love as I'm drawing towards the end with about one or two minutes to go. Look at this fella here. I'd love to go for a pint with him. I'd love to ask him, tell me about your tattoos, John or Jack. Tell me about your tattoos and your story. And by the way, why do you wear a belt and braces? Help me understand. But if this fella is 70, in 1974, he was 20. That was 50 years ago. And I'll tell you what he wasn't doing. He wasn't listening to Dame Vera Lynn. And he probably wasn't even listening to Andy Stewart. He was listening to Black Sabbath, The Sweet, The Jam, The, the Who. If he, was not, if he was 80, it would be The Stones, The Beatles. You see, all of our patients have a rock and roll heart. So how do we connect to those rock and roll hearts to keep them up, dressed, moving? And remember our archaeologists, they're like the gerontologists. They're like archaeologists. They look past the ruins to the beauty that lies within. And when we look at our patients, when we look at our colleagues, remember it's the beauty that matters. And then that perception becomes our reality. And finally, it's this. It's always remembering the care will always be more important than cure. And the reason is simple. There's only such much cure we can have because we all die. There can be nothing worse than the thought of not dying. When would you start a career? When would you start a family? When would you start a life? But knowing gives us urgency. There's a wonderful line by, um, by uh, the Nobel, Nobel laureate who did Waiting for Godot. His name will come to me, but he had this line. He said, maybe my best years are behind me, but I wouldn't want them back. Not with the urgency and fire I have in me now. Sam Beckett. And I really love that because there is an urgency to your work. If you look around the world, everyone is going in the wrong direction except you here in Scotland. And that is something to be proud of and to celebrate and to continue and to dream out loud at high volume and keep telling your stories. And thank you so much for your time. I'm not even going to try and follow that. <laughs> Remember, we do have some time. It is quite limited, but I'd be keen to allow that opportunity for questions and answers. So, hands up. Not all of you, just one at a time. <laughs> Anyone, any questions? We can make it a rehab program and just do some exercise. <laughs> That's the question here. So, I can just ask you to wait for me. Well, we'll get up all close and personal, and you can talk what? to the chest. Yeah, whoever gets you through the game, whatever. <laughs> I'm happy. Ian Keith from GDNC. How do we share our lived experiences and permission with the regulatory framework? We all have to go and buy the uh, 2,500 page admission documents we all see in acute medicine or acute surgery and that, uh, that we have to tick box everything. Because this is very inspirational, but the teams are struck down by the weight of paperwork. Yeah, that's a brilliant question. And nobody has yet to say, oh, geez, there's one place this needs more of is bureaucracy. And I think what we have to do is bring them literally, quite literally along our journey, walk with us. You know, in, in Lean, think you talk about going to the Gemba, because nobody's fixed a problem from an office. You have to go out to where the work is and to see people where they're doing the work and what that work is. And that explains why the bandwidth isn't there to do 100 page documents. So I've worked in Canterbury, New Zealand for quite a number of years. And this philosophy is high trust, low bureaucracy. You know, organizations don't succeed because of transactional effort. That's just doing the job. They succeed because of the discretionary effort of people who are passionate to make it better. And that means far less paperwork, far less submissions, and far more trust. So I think the regulatory bodies, because we can't walk away from its taxpayers' money, so we have to think like a patient but act like a taxpayer. But the, in the intention of protecting the taxpayer, what they actually unintentionally can do is disempower, disable innovation. So I think the only, because they are so remote, some of them are so far up, they travel with their own ox oxygen bottles, don't they? And we need to get them to the ground. We need more anthropologists 
We don't need people with a bird's eye view, we need more with a worm's eye view. So pull them out. And also, find what their personal story is. There's nothing like a, a personal story to make change happen. Because we don't want somebody that they love coming to harm because we're sitting in an office writing a 100 page report. But the only way we can make that happen, I think is sometimes breaking bread with people, is when you sit down and break bread. And, and my office is usually a coffee shop. Because when you break bread with people in a coffee shop, actually you learn what drives them, what motivates them, and then how can we work together to fix it? How do we build trust? Because you should be no them, it's only us. Do you mind if I added to that? Mm, please do. So every board I've been in is uh, associating us directly and above. I have challenged the team to say, I'll give you cover. Yeah, yeah. Stop it, stop writing that down. I have never managed to convince a team yet. I begged one of the chief saving units, stop writing all of that down. And I'll take the pressure if it goes wrong. They wouldn't give up. So there's a cultural piece we all need to address. Yeah. And we need to work through what is the story we're trying to tell. And for those in Lanarkshire, I stand by that. You can cut down what we read, what we write, because I do trust. Nurses, doctors, HPs will do the best that we can and we'll get them air cover. Yeah, brilliant. You're well, right, cool. culture. There's a, a, you know, a Maori saying, hey, at nui eo, he tangata, he tangata, he tangata. It means what is the most important thing in the world? It is people, it is people, it is people, it is not paperwork. Any other questions? Anything online? If not, Good thank you. Time. That is outstanding. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. So we're moving on to our break. So as always, we will be time pressured. And I ask you go get your coffee, get your tea, and actually go to your breakout rooms straight away so we can have as in as smooth a process as possible. For those on fall, I will be here deteriorating patients and patient suite, and we move from WebEx to MS Teams for those online. Okay, Wellbeing Creation Room and QI Innovation Centre. So thank you. I'll leave you there and grab a coffee. We welcome. We'll start our Falls breakout session. So I'm Lara Mitchell, um, and I'm chairing this event, this session. So we're going to have this is what's going to be happening. We're going to have a spotlight on session from my fabulous colleagues at Ayrshire and Aaron. Some Q and A after that, and then we are going to have a panel session with Brian Dolan and Don Skelton. So. I've got three questions for them, but just start thinking about the stuff kind of questions that you would like to pose to them. Um, these are our aims. We're going to hear from the Ayrshire and Aaron team about their polls improvement work. We're going to have this expert panel and we're going to think about their next steps for sustaining and scaling. So before we get going, I would just like to welcome the online team. And I would like to give a special shout out to Joan Marie, who, as you all know, has moved on, but is joining online. And I would really, I know you'll be embarrassed about this, Joan Marie, but we really want to thank you for your expertise, for your drive, and just for all the work that you have done for the most part of this collaborative, because you've been really influential. So let's just welcome and thank Joan Marie. I know you'll be going red at the moment, but um, you needed that shout out. So moving on to our spotlight on session, um, I would like to introduce Jackie Bartlett, who I've known for a long time. Um, in her wee bio, she said she's been a nurse for 37 years. Wow. She's been working tirelessly throughout that time to improve patient care. Um, she was at GGC with us and then moved to Ayrshire and Aaron and a false coordinator there. 
and she and Stephanie Frearson have joined up to make this dream team. Stephanie has been is QI leader Ayrshire and Aaron, and we want to hear a little bit about your work um, that's been going on. So welcome both of you. Um, so good morning. First of all, uh, Jackie and I would like to thank um, everyone for the opportunity today. Um, what we would like to do is really share our story and our experience of um, how we've approached falls improvement in NHS Ayrshire and Arran over the last few years. So it really is a game of two halves and hopefully you'll understand that as we go on. I just wanted to start by giving you a kind of overview of what our QI journey in general has looked like in Ayrshire and Arran since the beginning of SPSP in 2008. So, um, as it was pointed out earlier, 16 years, and as you can see from the map, we have been a board who have been actively involved in QI, both at um, um, national and local level, and this just gives you a kind of flavour of where our QI involvement has been. In 2021, we had we delighted to welcome Jackie into our team, um, and we're going to tell you a wee bit about why that's been so important over the next um, 10 minutes. So this is our why, and we've already discussed today why the why is so important. And this is our why. This is our falls rate in both our acute sites within NHS Ayrshire and Arran, ranging back to 2017. And as you can see, we didn't have much movement in our falls, and it wasn't through uh, trying. We tried desperately to make some improvements, and we almost got there on a few occasions. Um, but we just couldn't reduce our falls rate, and that had been it. that was becoming a historic thing. We probably didn't have the, the worst falls rate in Scotland, but we knew that we could improve in that and we really wanted to do better. We knew why our falls rate was like, was the way it was. We didn't have a dedicated falls team, a dedicated falls coordinator, and we didn't really have an agreed vision at that point of what we, what it was we wanted to do. So previous attempts at um, in reducing falls was, was, was really a kind of joint effort and predominantly sat within the quality improvement team to try and make those improvement activities. So no clear vision um, and we wanted to, we knew where we wanted to go with that. So this was our vision. We knew that we wanted to do something different and be brave and try and do that, just have a wee different um, approach to how we were going to reduce falls. We knew that we had to do a bit of work understanding our system and creating the right conditions, and we wanted to do that using improvement methodology. So effectively, what our vision was looking like was bringing those two worlds together. We wanted to do what we, we preach in the QI world all the time and bring that specialist knowledge together with QI and see if the magic would happen. So what we were doing around about the same time is towards understanding our where system was we were developing our own understanding of what was going on within falls within NHS Ayrshire and Arran. And on the left hand side of the screen you can see what was um, fondly referred to as our data dashboard for all the acute wards within NHS Ayrshire and Arran. And I noticed that David's in the audience today and I have David worked with us at that time and this was David's masterpiece so I have to give credit where credit's due David um, I'm sure you recognise it sitting there. So what this gave us, or what it gave each ward, each individual ward area, was their own data, the ability to look at their data in a, in a version that was understandable to them. And it gave them data over time as well. So we had this at site level and we had it at individual ward level as well, so that every month the wards could look at falls, falls with harm. We also did it for pressure ulcers and cardiac arrest. Um, and we could try and work with teams to understand what their data looked like and identify areas for improvement. We really wanted to be led by data, and this gave us a, an opportunity to do that and identify areas for improvement. Collaboration was a massive thing. You know, we wanted to work not only together with the specialist experts, such as falls coordinators, but with clinical teams. And again, this gave us the opportunity to do that. And what we did introduced on a monthly basis was a data surveillance meeting where we would come together as an, uh, and look at that data as an organisation and identify almost hotspot areas so that the specialist, for example, falls coordinators, along with the QI team, could share that data with individual clinical teams, help them to understand it and come up with an improvement plan together. So collaboration was a massive big focus. Timing was great for us at that time on that, on that part of our journey because there was the introduction of the acute adult programme with a focus on um, falls and that gave us lots of things around the falls change package. 
um, that could help directors and leaders on our journey as well. And it was agreed that we would do this all using um, the model for improvement and quality improvement methodology. So early in 2021, we had um, the pleasure of welcoming Jackie into the team. Um, sorry, Greater Glasgow, so we're shamelessly from yourselves. So I'm going to hand over to Jackie, who's going to tell you what this journey looked like from our perspective. So, yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, Stephanie says I'm Jackie. I'm Paul's coordinator for NHS Gershon and Aaron. Um, I don't work alone. I have Helen, my colleague, who was employed about 10 months after me. I sit within the QI team, which was completely new to me. I'm not a QI buff, but actually it's been perfect. It's been perfect support for me and for getting these change ideas implemented and tested quickly. Um, coming from Glasgow, I was in an established team. I worked in the falls coordinator for 12 years for GGC with another four falls coordinators and Laura, who was our lead when I left. It was a team with good processes, so I was able to take the, the learning from Glasgow and take it to NHS Ayrshire and Arran, which for me was great. I knew lots about falls. I didn't know much about QI, but now I do. I'm learning. <laughs> so what I had when I went to Ayrshire was a clean slate. I was sitting within the QI team. As I say, I didn't know much about that, but actually the wider team includes our excellence and care team, our practice de development nurses, and we have our data team as well. So it's perfect for me that we can all work together and see what's happening across our board. Again, Stephanie said about the driver diagram and change packets that was introduced in September. So a few months after I started, we had the perfect opportunity with lots of change ideas that we could work on. I met with the nurse director who says to me, pick 10, top 10 priorities and work away. So I was allowed to just go on, look around the organisation, see what was going on and see what work needed to be done. So the first thing I had to do was scope. What was in place in Ayrshire and Arran? What was the guidelines like? What process did we have in place? And that was really my starting point. What could I take from the work that we developed in Glasgow down to Ayrshire and put that in place? Then I had to look at the data. So, tech, tech, the falls per thousand bed days didn't mean a lot to me, but I was aware of the dashboards and how they looked. When we were in Glasgow, I had developed a tool for looking at falls numbers. And I know it does, it does a different story for me. It makes sense. I can see how many falls are in each area. What is our hot spots? Compare it with the dashboard, which our QI team and data team are brilliant at, and we could see where the hot spots were. And it's no surprise, our front door was one of our highest risk areas. Nancy's here today and she'll vouch for that. It's, it, it's so challenging at the front door. There's so many patients coming in, so many acutely unwell patients. So that was the really where focus was to work in the, in the front door. And we've got fantastic teams down there who are committed to change as well, which is working well for me. And um, what I did was the same as I did in Glasgow. I did a hotspot S bar for any ward who's a high risk area. And when I came to Ayrshire, I put the number eight, just randomly. If you have eight falls in a month, you're getting an S bar, and we're going to break that down to if it's falls in the same day, is it times a day? What is the common themes? Are they trying to go to the toilet? Is it delirium? Is it multiple fallers? And we just kept doing that right away. Um, and from that, we were picking up a few awards. We're picking up the same areas. We're no surprise, we're front door, we're gastro, but also it's no surprise. It was the same in Glasgow as well. So with the hotspot S bars, we met with the team and we worked collaboratively with other QI advisors who are all aligned to different areas and we went in this joint approach and we could offer support to the wards who are under a great deal of pressure. Some areas are hotspots all the time. Um, we dropped the number to seven within a year because we weren't picking up many, so we went down to seven and we're looking at dropping that to six. For the wards who are continually hot spots, we do a dedicated support. So that's the falls coordinator, the QI advisor, and the ward together, where we do unannounced uh, audits of the area, looking at documentation and environment. And then what went well, and I think that's really important to our wards to know that we're recognising they're working hard, if the patients are up and dressed, if they've got all their equipment and their walking aids and their buzzers beside them, and how can we support them? Then we looked at post fall management and falls with harm. So for me, that's a, a really important part is to support our teams through falls with harm impact on our patients and their families, but also in our organisation and our staff as well. 
And when I was in Glasgow, I developed a 4-5 harm review for significant harm, and I took that to Ayrshire and developed it there. So anyone who has a significant fall with harm, the falls coordinator also does an independent report, supports the ward, supports the adverse event review processes, LNTRs, SERs, etc. So got that up and running as well. The next was a referral process. So we needed to find out um, our staff had somewhere to come, you know, so we set up track here so that our staff can make a referral to the falls coordinator and we will go in and do a multifactorial assessment for these patients. Documentation is under review. Our lead for excellence in care is leading that work with a, um, a human factors approach as well. So all our documentation is under review just now. And we have developed an, an, uh, a new document for the front door where we're looking for all risk assessments for the emergency department as well. Equipment, um, we don't use bed and chair alarms in Ayrshire and Arden in our acute wards. So that's was one less thing to worry about. But what we do, we have multiple different beds. So the false coordinators and the QI did a scope of every bed we had, what heights do they go to, develop some posters. And then with the support of our chief nurse um, down in air, we managed to get some money together for hover jacks for all our areas with a flat lift kit. Education is a big one, as always is. So we did false champion training, we opened it to healthcare support workers, then to registered nurses, and then our AHP colleagues as well. And the AHP one was great, introducing the active ward, looking at decondition, and now we work collaboratively with our physio colleagues when we're delivering induction training. So we're talking about you can get these patients up, you don't need a physio, you know, and giving staff that confidence. Um, for education, we've developed three LEARN pros. They're still at the point of testing, so that's just ongoing work, and we're dealing with the NEST work as well just now, just to see how we can link in with that. Communication, biggest factor. We need to talk to our patients and families and let them know there is a risk. You know, they may fall, and we're doing our best, and come and help us. So we've developed lots of leaflets, lots of posters, so that our staff can build their own falls improvement boards. And then the 10th, Thing on my priority list was to map the driver and Stephanie, my lead, has been at the forefront of that, making sure we revisit the driver, mapping it out and seeing what next change ideas we can do. Right. And just the next two slides are just a couple of change ideas and I'm sure every health board have done these as well, but it's just how we linked it in. So the primary driver was person-centred care. And we picked the change idea, provide falls information for patients and family. And for me, been in falls for 15 years now, we need to keep our families with us, you know, we need to talk to them and let them know there's a risk and come and join us. So we've worked on where falls leaflets, we've done reducing the risk of falls in hospitals, safe use of bed rails, postural hypertension and community falls screening. What we did implement, we put the super six exercises within the patient information leaflet and the community falls leaflet as well. And our QI team tested that. We tested it, we spoke to patients, we got them to read it and families and let us know how they felt about that. And then we got that implemented. This is one that's really close to my heart and something that I'm keen to keep going. And this was under the primary driver organisational safety culture and it was post fall staff debrief. And this is something that's a work in progress, but I'm determined that we're going to get this in. And what we talked to our staff was the impact of falls with harm on them, patients who have had serious harm and how our staff feel. And many of our staff, when they responded to the survey, weren't sleeping at night, were worried about their jobs, felt a huge anxiety and upset when patients get harmed in their care. So for us, it felt as if this is something we really need to focus on. So we developed the pause for five, which is a post-fall debrief of a patient as a fall with harm. And it's something we've tested a few times, but it's something that we're going to revisit again soon. So that's there and anyone's welcome to see it. We worked on, we used it and tested it when we had a significant adverse event, but a lot of staff were quite traumatized and we went through that process and it worked really well. And just a, just a last page, and it's just some of our resources we've got here, just for leaflets, the behaviour monitoring chart, which I took from the one we developed in Glasgow, the hotspot S bar, line of sand and blood pressure chart, we're working on a post fall sticker for our nursing staff, some of our posters, and then lastly, our Gratix. Any ward who has a false three month gets a Gratix sent to their inbox, which is 
well received. And last year, I was pleased to say we had multiple wards who had no falls with four or five harm for the whole year, and they all received a great ticks as well. So I think it's important we celebrate success. And just to thank all our teams at Ayrshire and Adam from the ground all the way through to our management who have been so supportive over this last three years. Thank you. So just to finish off, fast forward three years um, almost, and I'm sure you'll appreciate that the vast amount of work that Jackie's talked about, all those tests of change that were developed, tested, implemented, and this is what our data looks like now. So for the first time in many, many years, we, we have managed to achieve sustained improvement on both acute sites, which equates to just under 14% reduction in falls for NHS Asia and Aaron. Um, it's not been without its challenges and successes, um, and I'm sure Jackie will agree, everybody will agree, we know the, the constant conflicting challenges and pressures that all our systems are under, so engagement has been very difficult at times, but that's not just for falls, that's for everything, quality improvement in general, it's been very difficult. Um, I think it's fair to say that Jackie and Helen have been drawn in many, many different directions. I don't know how many times I've been asked, how can I get a Jackie or how can I get a Helen? <laughs> Everybody wants a piece of them. Um, so we have almost became victims of our own success. I think the most important point for us here and the one, the message and, uh, that, that we really want to get over is that collaborative approach, that quality improvement and falls court, the subject matter coming together, it works really, really well. And I think the proof is in the, the data, you know, we can, we can demonstrate that. We have got sustained improvement. There's been a, it's been a great platform for shared learning. Not only have the team been now um, nationally, it's not the first time we've shared our story with the Falls community in Scotland, but they've also had the opportunity um, to go to IHI in Copenhagen, Copenhagen was Gothenburg. Doth Gothenburg, sorry, um, to share our model as well there, which has been a great achievement. I think our key learning points are that executive sponsorship and the support that we got. We did have, we were being very brave on reflection. We were selling, you know, we were going out there in a limb and saying, trusting us that this will work. Please give us money for a falls coordinator and acute. Um, and it did pay off. What that did bring with it was an alignment with operational management structure. And I think that in itself has got benefits, you know, again, coming back to collaboration, working and doing impro falls improvement, quality improvement. Um, with teams and alongside them rather than to them. We've definitely had a good experience in our journey with that. Um, Alliance with all the improvement projects, the SPSP collaborative has been perfect timing for us. And, and as I said, it gave us direction, it gave us the toolkit to go to, it gave us lots of guidance to help us on our journey. It was perfect timing and um, the collaborative approach. The most important thing as well has, has been the recognition of our learning, to be able to look back over the last three years um, and ask ourselves, what, how could we do this again? How can we make this work um, and transfer our learning? And, and what we're doing now is actually modeling this on our approach to pressure ulcer improvement as well. So we've been fortunate enough to um, secure some funding for a couple of years and we've brought one of the tissue viability team members out into the um, quality improvement team, integrated them into the quality improvement team, part of that team, and we're modelling the falls coordinator approach on reducing pressure ulcers within NHS Ayrshire and Arran. And I just want to finish with this journey. I showed you the Ayrshire and Arran quality improvement journey at the beginning. This is our falls journey. And I think what's really important for me and anyone from quality improvement community will resonate with this as well. One of the other things that we constantly preach about is about getting those robust processes right. And if we get the processes right, the outcomes will happen. And this is basically this map is a map of all the processes that were developed, tested and implemented with regard to falls improvement over the last three years. And our outcome has been sustained reduction in fall rates. So I think that's been a, a good demonstration. And that's one of the slides that we are planning to use with clinical teams to show them, because I think that is more meaningful than sometimes data as well as to show them this is what it looks like for you out there. And I think that's us. We're happy to take any questions. And thanks again for the very Thank you so much for sharing that incredibly powerful. No, you're standing up here, guys. <laughs> powerful story and journey of what you've been on. That was just wonderful to see it all. 
Um, and it's a marriage made in heaven, isn't it? It's just like a perfect partnership. And also that visual just shows how what you've been doing. You've been tireless in your work, which is, I think, what I wanted to get across initially. So thank you. Um, so questions from the floor. Um, I didn't bring my phone up, so I don't know the time. Um, oh, we'll wait for the microphone. And I'll grab my microphone. Daft laddie question as usual. Um, is a lot of this driven by a sort of combination of age and deconditioning? Falls in hospital. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I suppose, yeah, deconditioning certainly is a huge yeah. factor in all our wards just now. I think we, well, we is there, is, prioritize that. Is there much going on for the people who are young at the moment so that they're not deconditioned as much? And they become older, yeah. uh, you know, because the the uh, if it's if it's something that people can become um, active, more active earlier in their life, they might not be as deconditioned when they come to the. What's going through my head is I've got a very old father-in-law who's very ill at the moment, and uh, we're terrified he's going to fall, because he still thinks he's about forty years younger than he is, um, and just tries to get up out of bed, and we're terrified he's going to fall. But he has become deconditioned. But what I'm wondering about is if if we can sort of get the, the, the population fitter, will that feed through in the future so that you guys won't have as much work to do? <laughs> well, absolutely and amen to that. And what also I say, start somewhere, start small, and it's never too late. So there's evidence to show that when you're 50 um, and if you've not done anything that you can acquire benefits, um, which still is a very young age, I hasten to add. Um, but maybe we'll touch on that point later on in our panel chat because we've got um, Dawn and Brian here. Um, but yes, absolutely. Is there anything else, Dawn? So we'll wait for Helen. You might want to hang around here. <laughs> oh, well, why don't we take that question over there and then come to Dawn? Um, you mentioned that one of your hot spots were the front door areas, and we're really interested in um, measuring falls in our ED department. For your falls rate, did you use occupied bed days or attendances, or how did you get round comparing it? Attendances. Sorry? We used count. And Just the count. Uh -huh. So we've done a bit of work at the front door as well, looking at falls, risk assessment, um, and a new documentation that um, covers not only falls, risk assessment, pressure ulcers and delirium as well. But yes, we are, because before, uh, obviously, EDs didn't sit under the SPSP acute programme, and they were coming up as one of our hotspots. So we didn't have occupied bed days to measure it again. So we have just, we measure, they have a, a page on the dashboard, which sit, is sitting on Teams now, actually, but they can access that and look at their monthly falls count. Thank you. We've got multiple front doors so they're all different sizes so we're just trying to figure out a fair way of knowing if the if the count is higher in one area if it's because it's bigger or not so mm -hmm. yeah it's it's difficult with the front door i think okay let's do one more question from dawn and then we'll do the panel thank you hi dawn skelton um i'm being a, i'm being devil's advocate because i know you haven't this has, hasn't happened in your instance the best way to stop falls is to stop people moving altogether. So within your um, improvement work, did you work out a way that's achievable in a hospital setting to monitor mobility and mo whether people are being more active? Um, just, just wondering if you were able, because obviously I do that in research, but it's very different to what you can actually do in a hospital. Yeah. I think, I mean, it's a challenge and sometimes it's disheartening if you can come in and see so many patients in bed. We do have physios just now who are doing the active ward and they're doing work through NEST just now. So they're doing ICANN and they're taking on that role. I think as an organisation, I think deconditions another hospital acquired harm that we'd really need to be focusing on a wee bit more. So that's certainly for next projects is looking at deconditioning. But um Certainly, we know sometimes we can see that maybe the falls are going down, the pressure da damage is going up. Is that, you know, a, an impact of deconditioning or is it we're doing really well for falls? Um, so it's something that we need to consider as well, but it's certainly there. Is, is there anything from the online team? Yeah, are they, are they happy to share resources? Oh, yes, here we go. Get in touch. 
So yeah, there was so many resources up there on your slide. So please do. This is you. We all know this is part of the collaborative is getting in touch and sharing learning. Um, knowledge not shared is knowledge wasted. To quote Brian Dolan. I've got a bank of your quotes, by the way. <laughs> um, great. No, nothing else from online. No. Okay. Thank you so much, Ersha and Aaron team. Um, so next bit, I am very excited about. We're going to have an expert panel. Uh, so we've got Brian Dolan, who I've already introduced, but we have um, Professor Dawn Skelton, very gratefully has driven down from up north. Uh, professor in Aging and Health, Physiotherapy and Paramedicine, Glasgow Caledonian University. And um, we all know D Dawn really helped us with the driver diagram. So huge thanks to you. So we're going to have two chairs up here. Um, and I'll sit off to the side. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> they sit in the middle. That's what we both do have a chair, which kind of. Yes. Well, oh, you could maybe stand up and down in between each one. Yes. I, I, yeah, that sounds a good idea. A collective, the collective now for chairs. We be... could we could demonstrate some snack movements. <laughs> okay. Um, Standing. So meeting. welcome. Thank you. We don't need this. So, I'm just going to start with three questions that I have already emailed. Um, the, the experts about and then please be thinking of any other questions you would like to ask. So the question I want to pose first is things change over time. Evidence comes out. We need to stay abreast. I mean, it's just th things are changing continually. So what I would like to know from both of you as what's changed in your thinking recently? <laughs> Ladies first, is it? <laughs> um, most of mine is around, yes, we're probably a bit close with the noise. Well done. <laughs> um, most of mine is around who has the expertise within a falls assessment to then work with the mobilization or the evidence based exercise. So, for long enough, I very much believe this could be delivered at the point. So, if we're talking about people that fall in hospital, at the point at which they leave and they're discharged, go to a falls team. My, my thinking's changed recently, and it's to do with staffing, to be honest, that the NHS can't deliver an effective dose of evidence-based exercise. It's just not possible. It just doesn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so my thinking has changed about how we build the trust with community exercise providers, because I think that's fallen, falling through constantly in real life. Um, and the other thing I think that's changed is I always felt that if somebody had had a fall in hospital, it's really important that they get referred or signposted to a fall service on discharge. But I think that's already too late now. I think that people have developed such a fear of falling in the hospital setting, and then it's such a long time before they get to see the community falls teams that they're not beyond repair, but they become so frail and so frightened that it's almost too late. So I think actually the in, the introduction to the falls services should be while they're still in hospital, or it should be within a matter of a week or so of discharge, because we we've heard about just deconditioning in hospital. If people develop a fear of falling in hospital, it will be just as bad at home. <laughs> so I think we're just leaving things too late. So that's me. Okay. And what what's your vision about how we could do that? My vision is that we start having proper integrated health and social care so we get the community involved with the hospital setting at the same time. And there was a, a prime example of where I hoped it was going and then it fell through, sadly, and that's because of governance and structures, etc. was that the community exercise people actually come into the hospital setting and start working with patients there. So that the point at which they leave, they've already met the person they're going to work with. They're going to build a. They've already built that trust in us in an environment where they feel well. This person must be trustworthy because they've been introduced to me in a trustworthy mm -hmm. setting. The issue is that these are different organisations, different people that are running them, different risk assessments, different blah blah. And even though those people are cheaper than physios, um, there seems to also be an issue about having to pay outside a service and if you're going to bring exercise people in 
do I need to cut back on my physios? And of course, the physios don't want that because they are already short staffed for the time and they have to put into a patient. So we have to overcome an awful lot. But my vision would be that the exercise world would come in while people are still on wards. They'd start helping with mobilizing. They'd show them some key things. They'd talk about opportunities when they leave. They'd talk about how they're going to get to those opportunities. They'd break down all of those barriers that are just being left and people are just therefore not engaging. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I like that. So it's kind of almost reframing the outlook for discharge. Yeah. So you're 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 dealing with some of that hopelessness. One of the issues we have is that so many people who have a fall can't get up off the floor. Mm -hmm. We all know that because ambulance services, you know, one in five older people are picked up, dusted off, put back in their chair, and not taken to hospital, which we don't want them to be taken to hospital. <laughs> um, but nobody goes. Well, hang on a minute. We need to help them get back up off the floor so they don't call the ambulance services and have a longer wait for the next faller. Um, so that could happen in hospital. That could be happening. You've got, <laughs> they could be checked that they can get up off the floor or given some exercises to improve that. Sometimes it's range of motion. Rarely is it strength. Usually it's because they haven't practiced. So if they were able to practice in that setting. So those are the sorts of things I want to reframe. Okay. Um, because I think what's happening is it's, oh, you're out, and then it takes so long for anybody to pick them up and, and support them in the community that we've just missed a, missed a lot of opportunity. Great. Thanks, Dawn. And Brian, I know you've got your own thoughts. Is there anything that you want to go back to Dawn on that? No, you're, you're right, and so much of it's about... See, hopefully life will be that big and the amount of time in hospital will be that big, but too often we put this as the epicentre of things. And I see people who come into hospital as rescued, you know, hostage rescuers because we kept them into hospital and we keep them like a hostage and we won't let them do anything for themselves. And actually, we first start having district nurses in the emergency department or community staff in the emergency department and say, you think you're, they're sick? You should see the stuff I'm dealing with. Because in the hospital setting, we are, we are so... Um, you, our paradigm is so shaped by what we see within around us, we don't realise just how much acuity there is in community settings and the acuity of the patients that our community colleagues are dealing with. So getting them in to pull them out will be a, a very good start. And I absolutely love that idea of teaching them how to roll in hospital. I think that's just genius. And maybe that's part of what the physios can do. Because since when was it the physio's job to get patients out of bed? When did that start? Because that's not okay. And I'm, I'm owning this as a nurse. So that might be a better use of the physio. And I, I tell you what, it'd be a great crack as well. Right, we're all going to go over for a bit of a roll. <laughs> so, so, Brian, what's, what's changing your me, thinking? Yeah, for me, it's, it's actually it's a, it's far more existential because I've been reflecting as I do a lot on time. And I used to think of time as something that was linear, progressing at a space, pace of one second per second. But now I perceive time differently because if you are in hospital, while you're on the wards, you know, the staff are looking at, look, look at that, it's quarter past 12, not a child in the house washed, I haven't got a load of work done. But if you're sitting in a hospital bed, time comes dripping slow. When you're waiting, I mean, I, I got my internet finally, I moved to Oxford recently, getting BT to sort it out. They're as rubbish as they were 30 years ago. And just waiting for something basic or they say, we'll, we'll be there within a four hour window. I said, well, Amazon will send me a message. It will be there at 7.31 and at 7.31 and a half, they're there, you know. Mm. So waiting time is, is, I see it differently. And when you're having fun, when you're having crack, the Irish variety, just in case, um, you know, time flies, doesn't it, when you're having fun. But a friend of mine a couple of years ago, she discovered she had a breast lump. And she said that was the two longest weeks of her life while she was waiting to find out was that breast lump cancerous or not. And it helped me rethink what I thought, because 21st century learning isn't whether you can read or write, it's whether you can learn, unlearn and relearn. So for me, Great. it's about time. About time. Thank you. And anything you want to say about that, Dawn? Apart from the fact that I'm eight weeks post-op, so I spent some time in hospital eight weeks ago, and I'll, t I'll give you that, yes, everything takes absolutely forever. <laughs> um, and my key thing was mobilising, as, as you can imagine, um, and all I wanted was 
I wanted to be off that pain med that was attached to a thing that I had to walk about with. Mm. <laughs> Get me off it. <laughs> um, and that in itself, simple thing. But after asking for that, it took about nine hours before it was actually taken out. Um, and so that's nine hours I couldn't, well, I could mobilize because I could walk around with, with the, the drip thing, but many people can't. And so it, you're right, time just, and, it, and it's a lot of time for, and if you're older and if you're frailer, and if, the, if someone's saying, don't do that, you might fall, wait for me to come before you do that. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of time to process that and go, oh, I must be worse than I thought, and I must be. And that's why they leave hospital in a worse state <laughs> um, than, than the deconditioning that they got in hospital. So it's, this is why we need to try and check, reframe this, yeah. um, because it, it is, and a lot of that is, can't be done with the staffing levels we've got. So it's got to be engaging friends, family, volunteers, mm -hmm. and others. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. And, and actually, very pick, quickly picking up that point, we often treat old people as if they've got all the time in the world. <laughs> But to my mind, they're the ones in the greatest hurry. Mm. I like that. Yeah. Great. Thank you both for that. Um, I want to look at something different now, moving on to um, my second question, which is why do some teams succeed and others don't? I'd say it's to do with individuals. That's my personal. You can have... I would go so far as to say generally, you know, Brian and I are the sort of people that whip other people around us and we get, we, we are enthusiastic, uh, passionate, uh, usually have a sense of humour, etc. And joking aside, it's those sorts of people generally that can work well within teams. Again, knowing that it's not all about running something, it's about working with people and acknowledging, I mean, success, we heard it beautifully in the, in the Esher and Aaron talk just now. Let's not just beat people up if something goes wrong. Let's actually go, do you know what? You did a fabulous job there. What a brilliant idea. Let's try that. I think the things that work are when you've got somebody in there and it's not something you can do an interview for or you can... People, and sadly, some people have it and some don't. <laughs> um, some people are great being part of a team but don't want to be up in front making the, the noise, etc. They just want to be the good, hard back worker. And I, I guess it's really acknowledging what you can bring to a team um, and appreciating that everybody has skills. Uh, and it's, it's that kind of thing, I think, that makes a difference. And where it works, I think, is where everybody acknowledges what role everybody has and everybody's got an important part in that. There may well be a, a louder, shoutier, jokier lead, but that, that's, not, that's still, it, it's the rest of the team that makes a difference and it's acknowledging that. I think that's what makes it work. Mm. I think change would be really easy if it wasn't for humans. <laughs> and, um, you know, what you often find with, when it comes to uh, um, the failure of this, 80% uh, of, of change is uh, driven by project planning and meetings and Gantt chart, and 20% is motivating, inspiring, encouraging. And in fact, the percentages need to be the opposite way around. Because mm -hmm. change, is, change is, a, is a human contact sport and the way we make it work. And I'm not being flipped when I say it's one conversation, one heart, one mind at a time. It's not that organizations change, it's first people change and then organizations change. And it's in that order. Mm -hmm. And often it's just permission, permission to have a go. I was an exec director of service improvement on the South Coast of England. And I said to my team, listen, if we only make 20 mistakes a day, that's a good old day. And what I was actually not so subtly saying is, have a crack at stuff. Just have a go, and I'm a big fan of Change Tuesdays. Change Tuesday is, look, we'll make this tiny change on Tuesday, and if it doesn't work, we'll change it back on Wednesday. Because what you're really doing is to do something so tiny that actually it's okay to have a crack at it, take it really, really small. And then people, I don't think people mind change. They do mind change without reason, without a good why. And too often change is done to, not for or by. So you put all of those ingredients together, I think it leads to the constant, the seventy percent failures that we see of most change based projects. Mm. So, and you and you need the kind of the outsiders like myself and Dawn, you know, because I mean I run a workshop, a whole day workshop I call "How to Work with People You Want to Kill," and it's very much about the different types of personalities because you need all teams, you need all kinds of folk to make a team success, you know. 
I mean, when you were describing all the, the attributes and about, you know, found them additional, and I'm saying, yes, and we're exhausting. You know? <laughs> so so you, you need the people who are very much into the detail, into the weeds. You need that. You need the people who are decisive and driven and make it happen. You need the influencers. You need the steady, you know, folk who will take it on and it'll do it consistently. So we need the, the blend, you know, because you need a four legged chair is a lot more solid than a three legged stool and a, and a two led, you know, a two, it's just a glorified stick, really. So you need all parts to make it work. And picking your team means you pick the people with the skill set, not just because of their background mm -hmm. or their title. It's about the people first, the skills can be taught. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I love that flipping of the 80%, 20%. It is about the, the human factors yeah. Um, yeah, and the always. skill mix. The sad thing is that you can be beaten down, no matter how good a team is, if there isn't the permission given. Yes. If you're told, why did you do that without following this particular routine of governance first? I know, because this happened to me a lot at my uni. You know, the amount of times I've been hauled up because I didn't follow procedure. <laughs> Because I suddenly went, oh, that's a good idea. I'm going to try that. Um, and whap, you know. Um, and the sad thing is that the higher up you get, the less whapping you get, mm. which isn't fair. <laughs> it isn't. Um, but it's also, and I think Daniel's, I'm not sure if he's still here. Dan yes, there he is, Daniel. Um, an international colleague with us uh, over from Sweden. If you, are, if you are just never given permission to try these things, because the person a bit above you just, you know, has a paperwork trail and is only interested in the, that side, you eventually just become so deflated and you just don't try anymore. And I have to admit, when I was in hospital recently, I, f I saw a number of staff who'd obviously been through that and were just deflated. They were turning up, doing what they had to do. They'd lost the interest. Because, and I think that's because they were constantly being pulled back. So it, it, sadly, it requires at all levels. It does. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Lots of stuff there to unpick. Yeah. And actually, maybe just quickly put up that point. I think the risk is an assumption that change happens from the top down or the bottom up. And I think real change happens side by side. It's the conversations of people who are trusted peers, trusted supporters. That's, that's where the real change occurs. Um, you know, it's not one health system. There isn't one NHS Scotland. There isn't one NHS GGC or Lanarkshire. What we have is a thousand villages and the villages are at ward and unit level and each of them have their own separate sub and microculture. So it's how do we make sure we're meeting that? That's why we need anthropologists, you know, people who, are, who like to take the worm's eye view as much as we need strategists. Mm -hmm. and actually, that's where influences, I think, can help. Mm -hmm. If you've got at board level or executive level, they're not so keen. Sometimes you need the influences, those people that can take a group, and they can quite often then make a, a slight change so that the people on the ground actually get a chance. Yeah. Because we're just better at selling something. You know, as I, I'm sure you've had this. You, I've been told I can sell ice to Eskimos. You know, if if you have, if you've got the background knowledge to be able to throw the statistics, to be able to throw then sometimes that's what's needed to get the the rest of the the the, the, the higher echelons involved um so feel free and people should reach out to influencers if they feel that they're not being heard by by the uh exec yeah brilliant okay great lots of learning there i kind of want to think a bit more widely now about um, harvesting ideas. So Maureen Bizignaro and I, IHI is always on the lookout to what's going on next, where can she get ideas from, and I'm really keen to understand where you two as expert in your field, where do you go to, to harvest ideas? Older people. Older people. It's talking to older people. My gran was the person that got me into what I do now, anyway. Um, you know, she was she died at 98, but she fell regularly, almost daily for about three years. And it was only at the point at which she couldn't get up again that the fear started setting in and she started reducing activity. So this is before I'd even done a PhD. I just watched her versus my other gran who didn't move, just didn't move and was scared to move and everybody did everything for her. She also lived to 98, mind you. So it made no difference in longevity. But in terms of quality of life, the difference was gobsmacking. And I have carried on. I mean, it's all it's, it's all in in at the minute to do co-creation. 
um, and to do things with, you know, to listen to. It's not just listen to, they come up with half the best ideas. Um, so it's just constantly going back and talking to people. I am I'm now feeling a lot older compared to when I still see when I started and, and having had a couple of major operations and had the deconditioning. But I still can't be in the feet of those people, in the shoes of those people. And everyone is different. So again, it's not you know, talk to five people and go, I've had a panel with a group of older people. That's, that's five people. You actually have to keep doing it because constantly fresh things come up or people will go, oh, this is the only way I managed to get my wife, husband to do something. Oh, that's a good idea. I'm very much into um, behavior change stuff much more. I've produced, I spent a lot of my career producing evidence-based solutions. But if people don't do them, there's no point in having them. If people can't deliver them, there's no point in having them. I would go, you know, so I, I constantly now have to come back to, let's go back to the, the, the coal face, and that could be the staff that deliver, or it could be the older people that work, that are being delivered with. Um, and I think they're the, they're the change initiations. They're the ones that have the best ideas. Mm, great. Thanks for that, Dawn. What about you? Well, for me, it, it's kind of more, um, it may seem more domestic, but it's true, is Professor Linda Holt, who, uh, she's my boss. And we've known her for 35 years. She's um, she's one of the most original thinkers I've ever met. And I'm always about two years behind her, you know? And, and people quarrel because they can't argue. Whereas we argue all the time about stuff, whether it's about nurse practitioners or time or stuff like that. And um, she is such an original thinker. I've just, I'm just quite in awe of her and yeah, I'll make no apologies for that. Um, but I think the other thing is, is that uh, it's also reading, because while not all readers are leaders, every leader reads. And I think there's a danger in us taking a narrow um, specialism orientation to the stuff we read. We need to have a breadth. So I've just finished listening to a book on um, the politics of time by an economist called uh, Guy Standing. Uh, where he talks about agrarian time, industrial time, and now we're in tertiary time. And, and it explains incredibly well, it's heavy going, but why we are in such a precarious societal position where people, and, and that's one reason why I'm a recovering academic, unlike Dawn, who's a proper one, but I've kind of got fed up of constantly having to fund my own work, and fund my own jobs. So I'm still doing the same thing, but at least I feel some agency now to doing that. And I think it, when we look around, Adam Grant, a clinical, sorry, org psychologist, um, Simon Sinek hasn't written many books, or he's, what he reads is gold. So I think it's really, really important that we read very, very widely. And I also subscribe to The Telegraph, The, the Guardian, The Times, and The Independent. So the left to right spectrum, because I think it's also important to connect with people who you don't agree with. Yeah. And right now, we don't have disagreeable spaces. Um, picking up the points about younger people, you know, we've been selling off, we've been selling off playing fields. We've been selling, uh, libraries are closing down, pubs are shutting down everywhere. We're not going to spaces where we can find spaces to safely disagree. And I think that's a societal problem as well, because as Noreen uh, Hertz wrote a brilliant book called The Lonely Century, you know, we have become increasingly atavized and you look what's happening, you know, I'm, I'm going on a train to Sunderland, teaching in Sunderland tomorrow. I came up on Jetstar yesterday. And, you know, you, it's on your phone. So we effectively become self-loading cargo when it comes to being on a plane nowadays. The supermarkets want us to steer to look after ourselves, you know. The, the more, um, the wiser ones, like some of the Morrisons, I think, they're bringing back in the slow lanes because we're not connecting. And I often find about anyone else, but going to conferences, it's not the formal stuff, it's the connections, it's the in-between stuff. Those are the people things. That's a, and that's a very woolly answer on one level, because I can only speak for myself. But I think it's about finding people who you disagree with, finding people who you trust, finding people who make you think differently, that when you walk away, you see the world ever so slightly differently. Mm -hmm. Those are gold. And also finding people who love you enough, and they may be your best friend, your best lover, your best sibling, your best partner, but who say, actually, I care about you, and on this one, something's not right. You know, we need those people, because mm -hmm. the last thing we need is empire-based practice. We need evidence-based practice, and we need to create climates where people can say, actually, 
I have a different way of thinking about this. And that's what we need to foster because that's what psychological safety does. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So much in there. And just, I love that getting out of your echo chamber because I think yeah. when we work together, and maybe this is a challenge for Ayrshire and Aaron, you're working together, you get more aligned, your thoughts are, but stepping out and going, well, what about this? It's like bringing in that alternative view. Um, yeah. So me, I don't get frustrated at the Daily Telegraph because actually it's just a boring newspaper, <laughs> but it's important to engage. That's sort of I can't thing. imagine anyone being your boss, Brian, anyway. Oh, well, I think I let it think of myself as employable and Linda's going straight to heaven. <laughs> um, so I'm going to I'm just going to fess up and say I'm going to have to rewatch this because there's so much rich conversation in there from you both. Um, so that's my three questions. What is it? Twenty two, five minutes. So have we got other questions that people would like to ask? Well, we can ask questions <laughs> or you can ask questions. Yeah. Does anything come up for anyone? Yep. Firstly, thank you very much, guys. Uh, I'm Ben Watson. I'm the um, Senior Improvement Advisor for Excellent Care. It was just something that you touched on, Dawn, earlier on around um, one in five people, ambulance squelp, pick them up, dust them down, leave them there. So I worked for the ambulance service for years, and it was always that we take too many, particularly older people who have fallen into hospital. Um, they end up getting admitted sometimes when they don't need to. How do you prevent this? So I suppose the question is, from a community to a hospital, what do you think oh, needs to change in terms of the system for us to allow us to do that? I mean, I've, I've seen a couple of really good pilots over the years where um, at the point at which an ambulance service helps somebody up off the floor but makes the decision it's not time for them to go into hospital, so it's not been an unexplained fall, etc. Um, there's no obvious injuries. Um, at that point, literally within a day, they get a visit from a, a physio rehab team, a physio and an OT, who with a, a lift assist cushion, and they will get the person to practice getting up off the floor up to six sessions over a couple of weeks. And they've shown that basically that these repeat offenders <laughs> who are constantly being picked up and um, are, dis are disappearing off the books. So, but these pilots are great and then they all just disappear afterwards. It's time consuming to do that. And again, my argument might be, does it have to be physio and OTs? Because they're a lot more expensive. Perhaps it could be others. Um, but there's also, I've worked quite closely for a while with um, a guy who was in the Scottish Ambulance Service that had been doing lots of education with ambulance drivers and paramedics about not taking people in. The biggest issue actually quite often is the family going, you must take them in, they're not safe at home, I can't look after them, etc. So you've got that side. So again, you know, if we could set up stronger community services, whether that be charitable and not, not public health, as opposed to NHS, um, but just somebody that then can support that person. Often it's just practice, it's not, I can't, they can't do it. I keep coming back to that because um, and I do a lot of exercise programs where we teach in the community, retraining, getting up off the floor. And it's literally about one in a hundred, you can't get them to do that. The rest you can. Sometimes it takes weeks. <laughs> but the point I'm getting at is that we, we really need to be focusing on that. The other problem is that the feedback we were getting from the ambulance drivers and paramedics was, what's the point of referring them to a full service? It takes four or five months for them to get seen. I've picked them up another 12 times since then. And, and anyway, even when they go, they don't reduce falls. And sadly, you can't just stop falls. It does take a while. So it's also a lot of that is about the education of the teams to go, yes, it may not be an immediate outcome, but it, you still need to do that referral. Um, so there are a couple of things there. Something I would ban is the ter is the word pilot. Yes. Yeah. You know, because the pilot is so loaded now. People think yeah, there's not much point engaging in it because in six months time the funding will end that guy. So, uh, so Warwick Warwick Hospital has kind of come, overcome the family thing. So they've reduced conveyances following falls by fifty percent. And what the ambulance crews do, they'll do their thing, and then they they can they don't need to many many times. But they can call a consultant through Consultant Connect. They'll go straight through. And what the family are hearing is the ambulance crew speaking to a doctor. And our medical colleagues are fantastic because the ambos are fabulous. They know that they're, what they're doing. But it kind of gives the family a bit of permission as well, and, a bit of re and of course, the patients, and a bit of reassurance. And all they're doing often is just getting validation of their, of their clinical decision making. So it works on both levels. 
The other thing is they reduce readmission rates, um, and often it's the crew ambulance who have to bring them back into hospital. They've reduced readmission rates from 15% to 3%, because every single patient over the age of, I think, 75 gets a follow-up phone call. Every last one, irrespective of their reason. And then they can get in other teams. And I agree with you, Dawn, on this. Uh, we should be doing work where only you can do what only you can do. So that means more therapy assistants, nursing assistants, others doing that work. So it releases. Capacity isn't beds. Capacity is senior clinical decision makers and senior clinical action takers. So enabling the physios to teach therapy assistants and others to do that work, then bringing them in when only that skill set is available. Totally agree. And I'm coming back to your point earlier about why we're we not catching people earlier so they don't get this frail, so they don't end up having these issues. Um, there's actually a lot of research to show that falls up with harm are occurring earlier um, since COVID. So we've had an increase, we've got an increase in frailty anyway. But even prior to COVID, we're seeing more falls happening in the 50 and 60 year olds, falls with harm happening in the 50 and 60 year olds. Physical activity levels have never been worse. Um, and they were made even worse with COVID. And it's still not the common thing that a GP asks you. They'll ask you about smoking, they'll ask you about drinking. Do they ask you about your physical activity? <laughs> um, so we, we, we need to raise the profile of physical activity in general uh, across all age ranges. Um, and we need to empower the people that have conversations with them. We need to actually ask people if at any point they're starting to avoid activity for any reason. And if they come up with anything, whether it's I'm worried about my angina, I'm worried about falling, then we need to actually get them to people that can talk them through those barriers and help. But we're not. We're, late, we're letting people transition to frailty and then trying to pull them back. <laughs> Go upstream. Yeah. There was a temporary global peak of um, fitness and activity in teenagers a couple of years before COVID. Do you remember Pokemon Go? See, all these kids running around the country just sort of trying to catch the Pokemon. And what they saw was an, an, an increase, mm -hmm. but there is a lowering of fitness. And when girls go to secondary school, their engagement in sport just falls off a cliff. So we have a wider challenge. And of course, that has a long term effect as well. So, yeah, that's absolutely it's right. It's got to be fun. Well, that's it is. Yeah. Um, There's a lovely, have you seen that video? People, why I'm not getting exercise, I'm too busy, I've got kids, I've got this. And I thought, it's worked, I have to go to the gym. And then they asked these five, oh, it's fun, I get up and stuff like that. And there's actually these older, like 30 plus people, or 30 age, and 40, 50 and so on. They were quite moved because they'd forgot that exercise is supposed mm -hmm. to be fun mm -hmm. as opposed to a thing you have to do. Mm -hmm. So. Absolutely. Oh, that's us time. Weird. So um, before I thank this. Are you? God bless you. <laughs> Before I I'll thank the speakers happy. and we go and have our lunch, I think we do, should, in the aid of what we've just been talking about, do five sit to stands, not pushing yeah, absolutely. up. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Get those quads working. <laughs> absolutely. And, and you feel better. I feel like my brain's being perfused. <laughs> um, so thank you for joining us for the Falls Breakout. Huge thanks. To Dawn and Brian. That was an amazing panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, lunch is being served through there. And what time are we back, Helen? 25 past in here. Which street? 25 past two. So, I can bring you all back into the room and ask everyone to take a seat. So, hopefully, you enjoyed this morning just as much as I did and didn't have as many technical problems as I did in your morning. So, this afternoon, we're going on to the afternoon plenary, and Lindsay Fielding will do the um, deteriorating patient introduction and work her way through this. However, before we do that, um, 
has already been commented that it's David's last day as he's been working here. However, we have a number of people or one key person who's moving on to pastures new. So it's been a personal challenge working with her on patient safety. Dear Lord, have I been nagged for the last two years about this. So what we'll do, rather than you hear my chat, then it will pass to Joe. So thank you, Joe. <laughs> so we couldn't let today happen without acknowledging the contribution that um, Claire Maven has made to the SSP Acute Care Collaborative. Claire leaves us on Thursday to a fantastic new job in NHS Ayrshire and Arran and myself, the team, um, Healthcare Improvement Scotland, and I'm sure everybody in this room would want to wish her all the very best in her new role. Claire's worked with his for a number of years now and has actually worked across three different aspects of the SPSP programme. So she is well and truly in with the bricks. Um, alongside that, she has also supported a, a range of other, uh, other areas, but laterally has been back um, with that focus in what I would say has been your, your core passion of, uh, of acute care. So it has been an absolute pleasure to work with Claire within SPSP over many, many years. I know at times it's an absolute scunner, but uh, the majority of times it's, it's, it's pretty good. Um, we're going to miss you dreadfully. Now, if anybody knows SPSP, we, we do like to party quite a lot and have quite a bit of fun. Um, so we've got a number of um, things happening over the, the next few days with Claire, but we just wanted to start today to um, say thank you very much. Honestly, you have no idea how much that woman likes. So, Ayrshire, you have been warned. I'm just letting you know. So, so, thanks everyone. And at that point, I will hand over to Dr. Lindsay Field, the National Clinical Lead for the Deteriorated Patient Via His and an expert in her field. So, please listen and please engage with the rest of the afternoon. So, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Eddie. Um, thanks for, well, it's lovely to sort of close up this celebratory event um, of the deteriorating patient. Um, welcome back to our online audience as well. Um, so just moving straight into it, if you can, we're going to ask some questions again. So have your Slido at the ready. So I'll give you a couple of minutes just to. So I'm just going to set the scene for the work on deteriorating patients, specifically in hospital, uh, in terms of what, what is unique about a hospitalised patient and, and hospitals in general. Well, the word, a good phrase to use would be complexity, that hospital systems are extremely complex systems and settings with lots of flow and capacity. Patients are increasingly complex, living longer, they have multimorbidities, um, and treatments that are available are not necessarily appropriate to all patients. So I was just alluding to Brian's talk earlier, Clark et al, in terms of, sort of inpatient mortality in your K2 analogy. So you're, you've got a 10% chance of dying in a hospital admission and actually Another Clark figure is that if you're over 85 years of age, you've got a 50% chance of being dead within a year of a hospital admission. And for all hospital inpatients, one in three are dead within a hospital admission. So you've actually got more chance of coming down K2, if you sum it up, than being alive at a year after a hospitalisation. So inpatient cardiac arrests occur at about 1 to 1.5 per 1,000 admissions. The average age is about 70, and as we know, the majority of these patients, unfortunately, don't survive until discharge. So there's an opportunity to intervene before that, because we know that about 50 to 80 percent of patients have a predictable and acknowledged decline prior to a cardiac arrest. We have the backdrop of realistic medicine, whereby people are living longer and we're looking at um, shared decision making and 
reducing variation in, in practice and care and the backdrop of COVID, which I think really set the deteriorating patient narrative really into the stratosphere in terms of having that focus on people who may deteriorate quickly and what types of conversations that we would have to have with these patients and families about that deterioration. And I think when you come through a hospital door, there's that sort of power imbalance whereby you are, as you say, losing your agency, you've become a patient um, and how we sort of redress that imbalance. And I think that's really evidenced by the Martha's rule, which came about due to that, perhaps that power imbalance of being unable to identify someone that was deteriorating, maybe they weren't being listened to and the problem was not being escalated. In Scotland, we have the patient charter, which is the right to a second opinion, but in NHS England have taken that a step further by rolling out the right to a rapid review as of next month. So at HISS, of course, we always stay close to the evidence. We have news too, which again, the rollout of that across Scotland during the pandemic was a phenomenal amount of work. There was the statement on the initial antimicrobial treatment of sepsis from the Academy of the Medical Royal Colleges. And of course, our very own Dr. Gregory McNeil led on the work on sign 167 about the best way to look after the sickest patients in our society. So as you already heard, this was launched in September 21. And just looking back, it's amazing to think that at that point, there was 6,000 COVID cases per day in Scotland at that time. And that we were thinking about COVID vaccine passports to get into big gigs or to go on holiday. But a lot of positives came of that as well, and that with the launch, we developed this sort of virtual conversation, this virtual community, whereby we were suddenly able to engage with a lot of rural communities around Scotland. So prior to the launch, I think the data submission was much less than beyond the the, the launch of the collaborative. And so that you know, the, the priority was set at that point that deteriorating patient involvement would be the primary focus. So we've heard a lot about that already. So the main focus for us is to improve the recognition and timely intervention of deteriorating patients. And what we specifically look at in this collaborative is we'll call it reducing CPR rates because we're not talking about every patient that dies in hospital. We're talking about patients who have a cardiac arrest and have a CPR attempt. So we're really looking at the tip of the iceberg, but what we hope is that it's a proxy measure for the care in hospitals of people who are deteriorating. And it might tell us a little bit about pre-hospital future care planning, how good we are at identifying people and responding, and also perhaps recognising things like end of life care. So this has been your team. Um, I feel like I've taken the baton of the last 100 metres of the 4 by 100 and Gregor had the start of that journey. Um, there's a much wider team beyond this also, which have made, made today possible and all the other events. Um, so it's been wonderful to work with the network on the deteriorating patient and the work that has come from this collaborative has been used for other collaboratives. So just wanted to thank you for your expertise and engagement. Um, so the national picture, I mean, one of the biggest successes, I think we would say, is the, the data submission from Scotland is that we can see that there's a, a lot of transparency about the data that we have over 90% of the Scotland population represented in terms of what is now being submitted from NHS boards across Scotland. What we've shown is that, you know, as I said before, 1 to 1.5 per 1,000 discharges um, have cardiac arrests. So behind this, we have three hospitals who have had a reduction in their cardiac arrest rate. We've had three hospitals who have had an increase. But I think what is the impact behind that is three boards with a change in data collection methodology resulting in much better capture, much better intelligence of their data, and perhaps they were not measuring the right data to begin with. So specifically looking at our site level reduction in Lothian, um, two graphs here, one in the, the left shows St John's Hospital. Um, and this morning we were hearing about NHS Lothian's work on EOBS, and I really think that is 
you know, the foundation for the improvement work to, to be launched. So it's a phenomenal amount of work. Some everybody, every health board's at a different part of their journey. So some people are still establishing their data and building on that. So what have we been focusing on? Well, data reliability. There's been a lot of work across Scotland on shared decision making. Um, a lot of health boards have been working on digital respect, which is the concept of you know that shared communication between patients, families, and their clinical team and creating what they would wish, what matters to them. As Jason Leach said, what matters to you is the is the new vital sign. So very much building on that and looking at tips, you know, what happens when you come into an acute hospital? How do we know what to do if you deteriorate, if we've not asked you in advance? So there's a lot of work ongoing nationally around future care planning, and that is evolving as we speak. So that has been a key part of the work. EOBS, I think, is absolutely pivotal to what we do across Scotland because what we were hearing from the team at Lothian is really that, that you, for particularly big health boards, you need that intelligence, you need the data to understand what's happening in your own health board, to understand the areas that you need to work on and the richness of data that you can pull and that you can then calibrate that across Scotland as this becomes rolled out. I think there's definitely a few health boards that are really drilling down in their cardiac arrest reviews, so really understanding the different types of patients that are having a cardiac arrest. And as I said before, a significant proportion of those are those with a recognisable deterioration. Um, principles of a structured response. We had 10 boards that had participated in a mapping exercise using the mapping tool to take a closer look at their systems. So there's been a tremendous amount of work that we probably can't capture in 10 minutes, but that is just a flavour of the work that's been going on across Scotland. Oops. So I think going into slider, could you just reflect upon the work that you've been doing in your own health board and think about what has been the biggest game changer in your journey so far? And really thinking about what lies ahead. Yeah, so again, technology, strong leadership. And I think, again, from the narrative statements that have been submitted from all the health boards, what we were hearing is that importance of strategic alignment, that whatever you set out to do it aligns with the strategic priorities of the health board. And really the multidisciplinary working and education and training. So we've got a lot of comments here. News to technology coming out. Yeah. And co-working. Reliability of data. Yeah, so I think there are common themes here. Data, leadership, technology and reliability. So we'll collect those results later. So really just a time for reflection. I think my impression is that the quality improvement work is a bit like painting the fourth rail bridge. You're, you're never done. It's constant. Um, think of the journey that we've taken so far and how you will encourage and support continuous improvement because you now have the tools, knowledge and network of colleagues who can help you on your way. Um, just a little plug as well for our updated change packages. Um, at the end of last year, we developed, um, I suppose, in line with a lot of the emerging evidence, including Martha's rule that we knew was coming. Um, we've looked at the adult sepsis change package with ERG. I think Dr. McNeil was involved in that. And we've got a measurement framework also that we developed in February 24. So that's all on our website. I think this is a good point to finish on in terms of segueing into our next um, plenary session. I think we've talked about data submission, data reliability. We've talked about the learning system, but I think the, the most important thing is the impact that it has on patients and their families. And this was a piece of work that was performed by HIS. Uh, they worked with FEET, which is a sepsis research uh, charity and invited people with lived experience of sepsis to contribute to the diver diagram by sharing their perspective using discovery conversations. So I think hear the patient voice at every level, even if that voice is a whisper. So how do we represent the views of those who are underrepresented? And with that, I'll move on to the next session. We'll have Jane Merkin and Liz Tomlin 
they're going to talk about patient and family worrying concern. Um, Jane Merkin is the Deputy Director for Safety and Improvement Nursing in the Office of the Chief Nurse at NHA Scotland, leading on a range of national strategic priorities um, in patient safety and quality improvement. And Liz Tomlin, Head of Quality Improvement and Clinical Outcomes at Bradford Teaching Hospitals and NHS Foundation Trust. And I think we can ask for a more experienced duo to lead this session. So thank you. Wonderful. <clears throat> So it's uh, lovely to be back in Scotland. Uh, it felt a bit strange flying in last night and uh, coming to the Beardmore. I was trying to think when was the last time I was at the Beardmore. Uh, but for some of you that um, I've not met before, I lived in Scotland for 11 years and actually led the Scottish Patient Safety Programme from its uh, kind of embryonic stage in 2008. So it's great to be back. But I'm here today with my colleague Liz and we're keen to share with you the work that we've been doing across NHS England. Uh, think about what it means for you in the work you do, but also opportunities for us to uh, collaborate. I co-chair a national steering group, which actually we have the pleasure of having Claire as a member with a colleague of mine, John Walsh, and originally he was hoping to be here today, but I think he got a better invite. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm just going to talk you through from a national perspective, the work that we've been doing, uh, leading strategically an improvement programme to really make sure that the voice of the patient, the family, their worry and concern about acute deterioration is paramount and central in the recognition response to acute deterioration. Talk a little bit about some of the insights, lessons and learning, and Liz, who's one of our uh, collaborative uh, pilot sites, is going to share with you some of her insights. And then I'm just going to touch a little bit on Martha's rule and also share some messages from a lady called Kaylee, who is a patient who's had a very important experience uh, in relation to recognition and response and people not listening to her concerns. So I think we don't need to tell an audience like you, huge amounts of drivers for change and improvement and really the essential component of how do we listen to and respond to concerns of patients and families. And two years ago, I lost my dad, sadly, although he was a very elderly gentleman with lots of chronic conditions. I even found myself as a chief nurse in an English NHS hospital system really hard to get other staff to listen to my concerns, let alone my dad's concerns when he was deteriorating. And this recent publication that we had in England, which is uh, by our public health uh, ombudsman, really sets out stories from over 400 people that have talked about in their healthcare experience people haven't listened to, acted on or responded to their concerns. And I think that's a real indictment of what's going on in our healthcare system today and as a nurse and midwife still registered as a professional I think it's quite sad that we're having to re-emphasize re, uh, the importance of listening to patients families and acting on their concerns. So um, about 18 months ago we made a decision strategically in NHS England to lead a national improvement program. there had been quite a lot of work that had been done in relation to deteriorating patients and some consideration around what could the role of patients and families be. And I guess we had some hypotheses, we had some evidence about other healthcare systems where this worked well, particularly in Berkshire uh, in England, where they had published a seven year report demonstrating the benefits, uh, both in terms of outcomes, but also experiences from having a system or a response mechanism to listen to and respond to concerns of patients and families. And so we co-designed through our national steering group with patients, families, with staff across both the English NHS, but also working across the four countries and also looking to the international evidence base. And we came up with kind of two strategic aims. Uh, our first aim was how do you test and implement a reliable method for patients and families to escalate their concerns uh, about acute deterioration or, or illness. But more importantly, we recognised that that would probably be a small number of patients in any given healthcare system. So how might we find a way to reliably ask people, do you feel any better or worse today? And how might that be as a predictor of deterioration? And we'll come on and talk a little bit, and Liz will certainly share the work from Bradford, where they've got some quite impressive data. Uh, so we've been running the collaborative for nearly a year now. Next month, we've got our celebration event, which will be a really fantastic opportunity to hear from our seven healthcare systems and of course this work has been 
really instrumental in influencing the strategic direction of travel in relation to Martha's rule, which I'll touch on. Uh, so lots of stories we've had in our English healthcare system, and in fact, in case of, of Martha's rule and the sad case of Martha Mills, I've spent quite a lot of time listening to Merope and Paul. Now, you could argue <clears throat> Merope is a Guardian journalist. She's a very well-educated white woman and therefore quite able to articulate her concerns around acute deterioration. Uh, you could also look at the picture of Evan, the 21-year-old uh, African gentleman who was in a hospital and rang 999 from his hospital bed. Sadly, there are four years difference in the time period. Uh, and I don't often wonder, would we have uh, off the back of Evan's death had a family that would have been able to articulate so eloquently as Merope and Paul have done and have got the Secretary of State uh, and lots of other uh, government officials on board to implement Martha's rule. I'm just going to share a story from Kaylee now, so hopefully you'll be able to hear it okay. I think it's the app listening to what that patient is telling you. I think absolutely they are the expert and I think it's like working in partnership with them rather than um, separate from them. They're, you know, they are the expert about what's, what's going on either with their child or within their own body. And I think it's really important to make sure you're actually hearing what they're saying and if there are those concerns that they are listening to. And I think particularly with the worry and concern work that's ongoing, that's really pertinent to, to what happened to us because that would have been really beneficial to have that. We feel very lucky that we actually did get those, you know, that day with her, um, you know, and, and, and most of it was spent, uh, spent cuddling. Um, you know, she did manage to meet some some family members. She was She was at home. She would, you know, she she only felt love, and I think that that's, you know, what we hold hold really dear that we got to spend that time with her, um, and also, you know, that we got to have camera phones and we've got pictures and we've got videos, and I think that was, I think if we'd have known, we'd have taken hundreds, but you know, we've got that, we've got those memories. If you feel something is wrong, then then you know. Just keep keep pushing. Um, your instinct, just your instinct. A very tragic story, and and sadly, uh, her baby deteriorated at home forty eight hours after delivery, despite twenty seven phone calls uh, to midwives and to uh, paramedics. Nobody responded to the concerns of Kaylee, and subsequently, uh, her baby died. Uh, Telford and Shrewsbury are the trust where she lived and off the back of uh, her campaigning with some other members of the public and the local community, the Secretary of State that was of that period in time uh, commissioned the Ockenden Review into Maternity Services. At staff, I think in our work in Scotland, we've been really thoughtful. Uh, I was working as a chief nurse for the first two years. I came back from being in Australia and was really struck by uh, the kind of just stress that I saw really in a lot of our workforce and we know from a lot of publications uh, I mean our staff survey results 14 percent of staff have experienced physical violence uh, we've got 45,000 nursing vacancies currently uh, in NHS England and one in five new grads leave within a year of quals uh, so we also know that we need to do more to really look after the health and well-being of our workforce. And I speak specifically as a nurse, but that's for all members of the multidisciplinary team. And so in implementing this work, we were really thoughtful about what might be some of the unintended consequences. If we're putting in a system that's responding to patient family concerns, what impact does that have on the uh, professional judgment and the decision making of clinicians? And how do we make sure in our work going forward, we co-design this with them and for them? And so it's been great working with colleagues Liz and, and others in Bradford to see how they've been able to do that. Really important we think about compassionate leadership and making sure that we support our staff and that any incidents that don't get picked up and dealt with appropriately that we learn from those. Uh, we also commissioned a report from the Florence Nightingale Foundation uh, who worked in partnership with Michael West and the King's Fund. We asked them to look at what are the enablers and barriers specifically for nurses in escalating their concerns 
uh, and I'm sure no surprises, culture, hierarchy uh, and leadership. But Michael West also talked a lot about the importance of nurses being present. And if you're not present in the moment and with a patient, how are you possibly going to pick up on the soft signs or listen to their concerns or that of their family members? Uh, I think you guys all in this room know the importance of the issues. I think if we go back to uh, the case of, of Martha, uh, sadly, the nurses did escalate their concerns, uh, but the culture within the medical uh, community was such that they didn't pick up and listen to those concerns. And interestingly, the nurses felt because we've escalated it, we don't need to do it again. So the importance of us being able to respond and continue as professionals to raise our concerns regardless of whether they're acted on or not. I think again in the case of uh, both Martha Mills but the other stories that I put up earlier, in all of those there were at least five or six opportunities that were missed where we didn't pick up on the soft designs where nurses or doctors or other members of the multidisciplinary team did not escalate their concerns and that talks a lot about the culture and the environment. We're looking at all the data in NHS England at the moment around acute deterioration. Uh, a gentleman called Matt Inada Kim, who's our clinical director, uh, has done a lot of work in this space. And he's talked about potentially we've got between four and five avoidable deaths going on in each of our uh, English NHS trusts. So and it's such a huge opportunity. And out of those, probably at least three or four relate to cases where patients, families, or sometimes members of the multidisciplinary team have escalated their concerns and they've not been acted on. And so the kind of key insights really, I think, in again, room of people like yourselves, the importance of using improvement methodology, the importance of taking these ideas, these aims and testing them, uh, involving patients and families in the co-design. King's College Hospital, one of our pilot sites, has done an amazing amount of work with interviewing staff and interviewing patients and they found actually that 75 percent of patients said yes absolutely we'd be able to raise our concerns but interestingly only 35 percent of staff felt uh, that those concerns would uh, from patients would be valid so there's clearly some difference between how staff perceive this and how patients and families do we've commissioned an independent evaluation uh, a realist evalu evaluation to understand what works for whom and why and under what circumstances, and we're hoping that that report will be published in, in May. And that certainly will support and inform uh, the work of implementation of Martha's Rule, which I'll touch on. Uh, the importance of cultural change uh, and data for improvement, uh, and Liz will touch a little bit on their insights as well. Uh, this is the work from King, so I just wanted to share a couple of examples. Uh, where they did interview, as I say, a lot of patients and families and did similarly with staff. And the staff data was quite stark, really, about how many of the staff felt unable to escalate their concerns and didn't feel that they would be listened to. And as well, patients saying, well, if I do escalate my concerns, will that impact on my care uh, and the way that I'm treated in this clinical environment? Uh, so this is just some of our data from another one of our pilot sites. So this is Northampton. Now, I appreciate in the Scottish context, you don't have uh, critical care outreach teams, but certainly in our English NHS, that's a mechanism that's in place. Not in all of our hospitals. I think 129 have got a 24-7 critical care outreach team who very much can be there and available to respond. And in this trust, they've implemented what they call call for concern, a mechanism for patients or families to escalate their concerns. And then there's a response mechanism and from the data, you can see that actually only 7% of those concerns really do relate to uh, acute clinical deterioration. There are other issues that are of a clinical nature, and some of them are around communication. But again, as a system, there's learning there, and there's something about how these organisations need to understand what matters most to patients and to families and to learn from that. Uh, here's a very uh, interesting story. I won't read it all out for you, but in essence, this was a patient who felt he was deteriorating. The family were with him throughout the journey. They noticed a change in his condition. They tried to articulate their concerns. Those concerns weren't acted upon. And this gentleman then, because of the work that we've been lead leading, he could call a call for concern number. He raised his concerns. The family said that they were concerned. An outreach nurse responded to those, picked up the deterioration, patient got seen, intervention, and 
Of course, we never know this to be true, but potentially would have prevented a death or a further deterioration. Uh, we've embedded um, patient and family concern or parental concern into our new national pews chart. So part of that is asking then every day, does the child feel better or worse? Or for the parent's perspective, if it's a young child, do they notice any change? And we're thinking now, actually, maybe we need to do the same for our national early warning scoring system. And why is it that we've got to a 2024 with not really thinking about having that as a key component? Uh, just briefly then to touch on Martha's Rule, so clearly Merope and Paul were uh, very uh, successful in getting the attention of ministers. And off the back of that, we've got a patient safety commissioner. I think you're looking at having one in Scotland too. Um, so our Secretary of State asked the Patient Safety Commission to run a series of what she called policy sprints, a uh, wide range of multi-professional uh, attendance, a lot of the Royal Colleges, CQC, and other big regulatory bodies, and with some of our colleagues from our worrying concern sites. And that was really, let's look at what might this response system look like? How do we define the problem that we're trying to fix? And what's already working well that we can learn from? And off the back of that, then, uh, Martha's rule has, has come up. I think the challenges we've got in our healthcare system, probably no different to yours, is how do you go about implementing these? So the initial phase one work in 24-25 will be to work with 100 providers to implement these three elements of Martha's rule. And so working with those that have already got some kind of response system, i.e. a critical care outreach in our context, or hospital at night, or an acute response team, we tried not to be too specific. Um, I think if we were honest, we'd wish the Patient Safety Commissioner hadn't named it as critical care outreach because it would have given us a bit more flexibility. Uh, and we will try and see if we can test this in mental health settings and in community settings to really understand what works um, before we scale it up and spread it. And now I'm going to hand to Liz. Thank you, Jane. So I feel very lucky. I'm really sorry. I've lost my voice over the weekend, so I don't normally sound like this. So I said I'll try, try my best. Um, so I, thank you very much, Jane, for inviting me. So I just wanted to say that I'm part of the uh, National uh, NHS England's Worries Concerns Pilot, and I'm just one uh, one team or representing one team part of like seven other uh, organisations. And I think we just wanted to share kind of the work that we've been doing. So Bradford, we're in slap bang in the middle of the country in West Yorkshire, I'm sure you, if you didn't already know. Um, and as I said, we've got quite a diverse um, population in Bradford with lots of unique challenges. Uh, the infographic at the bottom we like to share because actually it's trying to demonstrate that depending where you live has a big impact um, on your kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, your longevity and as well as your kind of quality of life as well. So we know that there are health inequalities we have to think about and address. Um, and the little middle picture is just some of the team. Um, so I've got two two of the uh, um, ward sisters there and Maggie, who's from our critical, who's standing at the back with the red hair, a critical care outreach team. Who's she's amazing, and bookend by myself and Lisa, who are part of the quality improvement team. So who are we? Just saying we've we're sort of a quite a sort of a broad team, but there's a um, a core core um, group of us actually sort of supporting this work. Um, and Brian Wilkinson, who's our clinical lead, is a fantastic advocate for this work and is really passionate about it. And so is Maggie, and that has made a massive difference to I think the, to the work that we're doing. So as Jane was sort of saying, there are two key aims for this particular um, uh, pilot. And we've gone to sort of really sort of focus at Bradford on that second aim, which was really about trying to um, really sort of test and implement a, a method that we'd always selected. And that's something called the patient well, well, wellness questionnaire. Now, this is a piece of research that has been, been done and we wanted to kind of translate it into practice. So it's essentially a measure that we can use to routinely collect patient reported wellness during observations in hospitals. That's what it was designed and that was that said um, from a research perspective. And it may potentially improve early, de um, deterioration, um, early, detection, of, early detection of deterioration. And it was done by Abby Albert, who um, was actually uh, based at University of Leeds working with Rebecca Lawton as one of our key supervisors. Um, and so she did this piece of work, it was in the NHS, and she sort of devised a couple of questions in which she could test out and to see if that was going to actually pick up some soft signs around deterioration. 
So from that research, we've developed this. So we've done a little bit of work um, with our co colleagues over in Bolton as well. So we've got two questions. These are sort of, there's on an A4 piece of paper, which I've actually got on my bag over there, laminated. An A4 piece of paper, which you use to kind of prompt a question and a kind of cover conversation with our patients. So when they first come in, we ask them a question, how are you feeling to get that baseline? And then we can come back and ask them again, how are you feeling? And then how are you feeling compared to the last time we asked? And underneath there's like a little scoring system. And as you see, we've, we've sort of devised and been testing out our mate decision matrix. So for the eagle eyed of you and all the risk uh, people, the decision matrix is those, those scores are added. They're not multiplied. Um, so, as I said, so our little decision matrix there is depending on what the score is. When you've asked those two questions together and added it up, we'll then determine what you do. So if you're scoring sort of two to five, continue to monitor. So that means you do your observations, you keep asking. And if you notice perhaps um, if there's perhaps a change in their condition, if it's a six to a seven, it's telling the nurse in charge and they should be able to make some uh, decision around whether they're going to escalate or whether um, to support sort of the, the conversation to have with the patient. If it's an eight to ten, that's a direct call to the critical care outreach team. So, again, this work has not been possible without really full in, uh, sort of um, buying from our critical care outreach team. So they know that actually if they got that call saying patient wellness questionnaire is eight, even though their news might be two, that would be a trigger and they would come and see the patient. So I'm really pleased because obviously you've talked about model for improvement and that's what we use at Bradford. Um, and this is our little kind of logo that we use um, for the model of improvement. So, again, what we were trying to achieve was trying to kind of actively engage with our patients, cap carers and families in the acute care setting to put in their in to sort of gather their input into their views about their wellness. And we wanted to sort of obviously this, um, well, not obviously, but this work is going on to the end of March and we've got our celebration in April, haven't we, our event. So we had some measures for improvement <clears throat> and our change idea was around the, the patient wellness questionnaire. So again, making sure that we started off with those really key principles about quality improvement. We started on Ward 21, which is planned surgery. We thought it felt it sort of a, a safe place to start because we knew patients are coming in. They're probably well, they're coming for planned surgery. Let's see how it goes. So we started our work um, back in April on um, Ward 21. Um, which was again for planned surgery, 20 beds, but actually we only did it in one bay. So this is one of the bays that basically when patients came back immediately from surgery. We also then went and tested it in uh, Ward 7, which is an infectious diseases ward, and that was um, from July onwards. And again, that's a 12 bedded ward, unusual by the fact that it's 12 side rooms, so you can't see anything. You have to go into the patients and actually see, see what's going on. So, as I said, it was again a, 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 a sort of a different area to test out um, the, the the patient wellness questions. And then we've just started working on the ward ward nine, which is stroke rehab. It's a new brand new ward and step down. So very quickly, some of our data ward twenty one. Said, is that you know your good run chart should be able to tell you stories, but it's just, I just want to sort of demonstrate that actually we saw lots of variation. Um, Ward 21, the way that they decided to use it, and again, this was based on the early research, was suggesting that healthcare assistants should do it at the time of observations. Basically, what we found was actually it wasn't done consistently with healthcare assistants, and actually, as you said, sort of demonstrated by our, our data there, but there's lots of learning, and we tried sort of tweaking and changing. Um, and actually, we found rather than doing it at, at the time of observations, it was actually more usually more successful when it was done outside of observations. So that was learning for us. Ward seven was really interesting. So Ward seven, when we went approached them, they wanted to, the re registered nurses and the sister wanted to take the lead on this, and that made all the difference. So essentially, this is our run chart for patient wellness questionnaires being um, collected. Um, at least three times a day, and we're saying, we're, we're, as I said, on average, I think we had 67% of the time being done three times a day and recorded in the notes, but that was because we think it was around the, the, the leadership. Ward 9, we just started work on, so I won't talk a little too much about Ward 9 because I wanted to show you a few more slides. So that's, again, just our kind of referral rates from critical care, which, um, and you can sort of see towards the end, we've sort of seen an increased number of critical uh, referral out, um, referrals, uh, which is managed is a manageable number for our, our particular team. Um, and actually on Ward 7, where we saw, again, that really kind of uh, great engagement, we saw, as, as I said, that initial 
work has sort of again lots of referrals to critical care about the outreach team which when they were worried about patients very quickly our patient story so again on ward seven we had a 52 year old gentleman that came in he'd had bowel cancer he'd had surgery he'd come in with dnv and he was really really poorly his news two score was scoring between one and four so that wouldn't have alerted anything that wouldn't have triggered anything in our trust but the sister at the time he was doing patient wellness questionnaire it triggered a six but she was sufficiently worried enough about this patient that she called the critical care outreach team they came to see him he was acutely unwell um, and actually he was then prompted regular uh, medical reviews uh, by the medical team the gentleman did actually unfortunately arrest and die um, and i think that's something that we've learned from when we've been doing this work that actually sometimes picking up deterioration that may be the not the natural trajectory for a patient and actually, we, if we're detecting that perhaps there's some deterioration, we might be able to intervene with end of life care earlier. So it's not always about rescuing. It's just making sure we're trying to give the, the patient the best um, outcome we possibly can. So very quickly, leadership absolutely massive. Um, we think that actually doing it outside of observation is, is, is far more uh, um, successful. Um, and we're sort of continuing to sort of, like I said, continue this work. I'll show you this very briefly. So we're also very keen around our learning disabilities. Um, uh, so we, we're using this as a way to be able to prompt conversations with patients and families to, to be able to then ask these questions to then be able to use the patient wellness question. And again, this is work we've done with um, through, through the collaborative and we're just starting to set to test this out. So there we go. <laughs> Thanks very much, Liz and Jane. I think you've given us all food for thought there. This feels like the way forward in terms of managing deteriorating patients in hospital. Are, are there any questions in the room? Standing to silence. <laughs> Can I allow you to start? Um, did you have, did you notice a, sorry? Yes, yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> The Hi there, I'm Judith Rolston. I'm a, one of Scotland's very few critical care outreach nurses uh, and I work in the Beetson. Um, and we've thought a lot recently, um, been talking a lot about that cause for concern calls that families and patients can make. And I'm interested to hear if you can describe a little bit that process where you brought the clinicians along with you in that so that it was deemed as not something that was a conflict rather than something that that brought more more care for the patient and and helped so i think there's something around so quite often when we're having those conversations with um staff they were saying when i phone up and tell the doctors and just saying they're just not right i just don't i know they're not right they're, they're saying they're not right again what's their news and it's three oh, okay um so actually there was something around here saying there was it was something about giving some legitimacy around a score and a number um and i i think that actually when they sort of understood and when they sort of started sort of seeing kind of like when they came to see the patients again actually they are quite um, unwell and poorly we, we had very little resistance we've also got great advocacy from our um, um brian wilkinson who's one of our anaesthetists he's, he's really engaging so again it makes that um makes that easier to, to again clinicians talking to clinicians to getting that buy-in um, and understand that actually so i mean the patient wellness questions is something around actually if you pick it up earlier we're hoping actually those soft signs you, you're kind of further down the um, you know, further upstream, downstream, I which way going now. Um, but you're you are trying to kind of you know resolve things before they become like panic stations and thinking actually mm -hmm. this patient's now really requiring um, you know perhaps an off to intensive care. So it's not been an issue to be fair. Mm -hmm. Actually, we know that there are obviously things like Martha's rule. We know we're going to have to do something. We know we're going to have to address and think about it. So actually, mm -hmm. it's not really been a barrier. Things positive. Any other questions? Thank you. I really loved your wellness questions. I just wondered if you had any thoughts about um, catering people who might have different communication challenges, people with the first language, people who might not be able to articulate. Do you use visual ones or have you had any thoughts about? 
the space so the, to do that. So the images are, as I said, we've got the, the smiley faces. We're doing some work. Um, so I've, gonna, I've been doing some work with um, people with limited experience with learning disabilities around actually how they use it. So I showed you that last slide with the questions as prompts. They're able to then go in and interpret the questions you're asking and, and looking at faces. Those coloured faces also match our patients, the friends and family test. Do I do friends and family? The friends uh, for NHS England. So there's something some familiarity. Uh, we're looking at doing some different languages. We're also looking at doing QR codes. Uh, we've got the virtual um, in AI where you can like you can have any language you like. So we're going to be presenting some of that work um, at the. Uh, the final event, but yeah, that's that is our ambition to make sure it's Very accessible. Impressive. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, I think there's another one more question. Hi there, thanks. Um, John Harden, Deputy Clinical Director, NHS Scotland. Um, fantastic, love it. Really, really like the the questionnaire. I suppose there's one question that comes into my head is you presented information there about the number of critical care outreach and that raises in my head the support question um did it need do all those cases need a critical care outreach team could it be flagged up to local care teams in the ward for further action and what difference did the critical care teams make to the the vast majority of patients that they came to see so we have done a bit of a case study so for everyone that was re was reviewed we put our, put our junior doctors to good work and they've done a case study review and you're right, we're trying to sort of evidence actually what was the impact. Was it just about reassurance? Did we pick up deterioration? And actually, we've got quite a few patient stories where we have picked up actually, again, patients saying they're not well, new, not seen them physiologically in the observations. And it was often sometimes our younger patients who will probably be able to continue on for much longer before they then suddenly drop. Um, and just as, so. I'm not answering the question, but we're also thinking about, you know, other areas. So we're, we're working in paediatrics, we're working in virtual ward situations. Well, again, trying to be a bit more proactive, um, getting patients to actually phone up and saying my patient, what, you know, my score is. Um, I think, John, as well, um, so Southampton, they've had a very um, long established uh, critical care outreach team. Actually, in that trust, what they've decided to do is implement a filter. And so they've put either a senior nurse or at night, they've got hospital at night to manage it. So actually that way, then they filter out the calls that clearly need to go to critical care outreach and need a proper response or those that might be, you know, ward department. And I think the biggest issue is making sure you've got that loop to close the loop and feedback to the ward that doesn't disempower them, that gives them feedback for learning and improvement and makes them think about, well, what could I have done to have prevented that from happening? A lot of the critical care outreach uh, teams, so we've got operational delivery networks in England and critical care outreach uh, networks, and I think they're all quite anxious about Martha's Rule, both in terms of will it increase activity, will they have the capacity to respond, and what happens to the trust where we don't have it. Uh, but I think the numbers, when you look at them, are small, actually, um, and I think the work that Liz and colleagues are doing to really be more proactive I think in maternity list, didn't you do some work looking at in a busy maternity assessment unit where women are sat waiting? How did you get them to say, I feel worse than I did when I got here two hours ago? And then how do you reprioritize your triage system? I'm just about to start that piece of work. Yeah. So. Well, good question. I think we've got one online question as well, just to remember our online audience. Hello. Yep. Thanks, guys. Um, question from Katie Mackay online. I think you kind of touched on it a little bit there. Have you had any patient wellness fatigue feedback from your medical teams? And hopefully I've captured what you've asked there, Katie. No, actually, so for Ward 7, where it's worked really well, the staff really like it because actually, mm -hmm. sad to say that they feel that it's an, an opportunity where they can actually have time to communicate and actually talk to their patients. Mm -hmm. And I think so we are so we are you know fully digital, everyone's wedded physically to their computers on wheels most of the time, mm -hmm. screen, and we've lost a little bit of that um mm -hmm. patient contact, mm -hmm. even touch, mm -hmm. even how you're doing. And it's it's more than just because it's well, we ask how people are doing all the time, okay. It's more mm -hmm. than that. 
So actually, as I said, it's about re-engaging uh, with patients. So yeah, they've, they've really liked it. And actually it's been quite, because of such sort of strong leadership and belief in what this is about. Okay, thank you very much. We'll draw it to a close there. And it's just a quick plug to say also in the deteriorating patient change package that we do have specific measurements around worrying concerns. So we are, fingers are on the pulse. Um, so keep in touch. There's a lot of discussion. If you have more questions, you need any resources, please email. Um, keep in touch with Yep, I think we'll just move on now because I've seen the big time sign. So it's over to you. Thank you. So thank you, Lindsay, and thank you for the presenting team. I think you're right. Good for thought. But our next evolution probably needs to look like. So for our online audience, it's a thank you from us and it's a thank you from everyone in the room for your contributions. The streaming part will now finish. We would encourage you to do the um, feedback forms done again on a QR code. But thank you for your attendance and thank you for your contribution. For everyone in the room, we move on to our second breakout sessions. You should have them logged on your um, lanyard. So again, please gonna try and move over uh, as smoothly as possible. If you can grab a coffee, fine. That's maybe your best opportunity to get one, say, for the afternoon. So thanks very much, and I'll see you in your breakout rooms. <laughs>